Tonight, we are discussing Bram Stoker's Dracula, the 1992 film directed by Francis Ford Coppola. This podcast will not be for the faint of heart, so proceed of your own will and leave some of the happiness you bring. As always, we'll give our overall thoughts on the movie, then we'll go into a detailed recap and analysis. I'm Gil, by the way, and the reason for that awkward pause is I thought we rehearsed this, Daniel. I thought you were going to walk away as soon well, as I said I, the enter of your own will thing. You know, this is just like the argument that Francis Ford Coppola and Gary Oldman got into. I didn't know what my cue was, because I thought you were going to say, if you know, for the not for the faint of heart, so leave if you're faint of heart, uh, but then you were saying leave your joyful feelings or whatever behind. And so I had never, I don't know, I didn't know what my cue was. You got that uh, reference though, right? From the movie Dracula. When what was the reference? Jonathan Harker, when he gets to the entrance to Dracula's castle, Dracula emphasizes enter of your own free will. Oh. And so I was quoting directly. All right, we'll get to that part. You don't have to remember every step because I'm going to recap it all for you, as always. So some quick background on the movie. It was written by James Hart around the same time he was writing the movie Hook. And Winona Ryder actually brought the script to Francis Ford Coppola to see if he was interested in directing. And I guess there was some awkwardness because she was supposed to be in Godfather Part 3. And then I think she wasn't feeling well or something, so she dropped out. And she's like, Francis Ford Coppola hates me now. And if you look at some of the behind the scenes stories of some of the yelling Coppola has done and fights he's gotten into on the set, I could see maybe being a little, I don't want to piss this guy off. But anyway, she maybe I shouldn't have said that. I don't want to piss this guy off. So <laughs> Winona Ryder brought him the script. And he, he was, you hear kind of mixed things. Some people will say Cop, Coppola basically admits on the DVD commentary, he just did it for the money. Now, I think that's true to some extent except for the word just. He definitely did the did it for the money, and I don't think he would have directed this movie if he didn't get paid to. But it was part of this moment in his career where he no longer wanted to be beholden to the Hollywood system. He wanted to make enough money that he could just turn filmmaking back into a hobby. So he made Godfather Part 3, a movie he definitely did not want to make. And then he was like, Dracula is part of this. It's one of the other movies that's going to get me a bunch of money. Then I can invest in wineries and other stuff and just coast as a bit. I shouldn't say coast. I'm sure he works very hard. He basically became a businessman after this and turned filmmaking back into a hobby. And I will leave it up to the audience to decide if that was for the better or worse. Uh, Coppola in the commentary again, he kind of emphasizes that this movie was not his script. Not in a negative way, but just saying my role in this was director. But I was just watching an interview with James Hart where he says that there was actually a lot of collaboration up front. Once Coppola was brought on, the two of them really workshopped the script. And one of the things Hart loved is that we did not start shooting until that script was totally locked, which is something you and I talk about a lot. The fact that that has to be like a commendable thing. You didn't start spending millions of dollars and waste a bunch of people's time to shoot this until you knew what you were shooting. Feels like that's. 101, you should have a script locked before you start. But I understand the reality of the business. You have release dates you have to meet. The movie, they cast Gary Oldman as Count Dracula, Winona Ryder as Mina Harker, and Elisabetta, Anthony Hopkins as Van Helsing, and Keanu Reeves as Jonathan Harker. Uh, I have to point out that this is a movie I knew very little about before we watched it for this podcast. It's a movie I've wanted to watch for a long time, and I've learned nothing about it because I've known for 20 years, I want to watch that movie, so I don't want anything spoiled for me. So I really didn't know what to expect, but I've always had in my mind this image of what the movie is, and for some reason, I thought that I don't even know if I should admit this, but in my mind, oh yeah, that's the one where, um, that's the one where, who's the guy from Dune? No, the Emperor. Oh, Christopher Walken. I was like, yeah, yeah, Dracula, 1992, that's where Christopher Walken plays Count Dracula. I don't know why I had that in my mind. Apparently, he did play a vampire in the movie The Addiction, like two years later. I don't think I ever heard of that movie, though, so I'm not sure where that came from. In any case, this movie has quite a legacy. 
It shaped some of vampire culture after it came out. Helped to rehabilitate the image of Dracula, who for 60 years was just a guy in a tuxedo and a cape. And it kicked off a little trend of prestige monster movies. A couple years after this movie, you had Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where Robert De Niro played the monster. And the original plan was that Coppola would direct both movies, Dracula and then Frankenstein. And then I think just while he was making Dracula, he's like, I don't know if I want to do this again. But it was also written by James Hart. He wrote both of them. That same year, 94, you had Wolf, kind of a take on Wolfman with Jack Nicholson. You had Mary Riley, where John Malkovich played Jekyll and Hyde. And then, have you ever seen Interview with the Vampire? Tom yeah. Cruise. Yeah, I remember loving that movie. I've been meaning to rewatch it for years. But that also came out in 94. And the director specifically cited 1992 Dracula as a huge inspiration for that movie. The way it used vampires for this almost romantic epic. Vampires don't have to be this cheap thing you just throw out there. He was definitely inspired by that. And then a lot of best vampire movies of all time will include this one on the list. Now, that's some of the background. So I saw this for the first time recently. You did too. I think you just saw it for the first time last night. And I feel like I wanted to go into my overall thoughts, but I've done so much talking now. Maybe I want to pass it over to you. Tell me, what did you think? I'm so curious because you're not into horror. This feels like, and this is one of the things I love about this podcast. I, it's like I can take you captive and force you to watch something, <laughs> except for Terrifier 3. I couldn't make that happen. And I get to hear, what did you think of this? Well, so just to clarify, I don't, when I don't like horror, I don't like gory stuff, super creepy stuff, things like that. This kind of horror, I like. I like gothic stuff and i like vampires i watched true blood interview with the vampire buffy the vampire slayer i like vampires i like the genre and so i was excited about this movie and i did i i liked it a lot i thought it was it was just very similar to megalopolis which is the other coppola movie i've seen to me it like just felt like an adventure like i'm just seeing a lot of things that i've not really seen done before like it just felt so different and unique the other thing, though, and we talked about this with Joker, was like Joker is, you know, they make it look like it's like in the 70s. And so it gives you this feeling like you're watching a classic movie the whole time, which makes you think it's better. Right. And I don't know, movies from the 90s, I don't really think are classics, but maybe Bram Stoker's Dracula at this point is a classic. But watching it, it feels like it's from like the 70s or something. So it feels like it's twice as old as it is which, I don't know, gave it a whole different vibe the whole time I watched it. But of course, that's also what Coppola was going for, right? With no computer effects and stuff. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I love the vibe of the movie. And it was fun. It was very unique. I really liked it. This one thing when you said, you know, Megalopolis, the other Coppola movie I've seen. Let's just say it's the other Coppola movie you've seen recently. You've got... What other Coppola movies have I seen? I saw Apocalypse Now. Okay, there you go. God, I, I don't know if it. you've seen Godfather. You probably no. I see, need to. Yeah, you should see that. Uh, yeah, that's a, this is a hot take. I feel like Godfather. This is a pretty good movie. Um, but also, where you say this movie feels like you know thirty years older than it is, or twice as old as it is. I mean, really, if it can sometimes feel four or five times older than it is, because one of the really unique things about this movie, it uses so all the effects are in camera, and it's using techniques that were used in the silent era. So just a couple of examples. One way, you know, we're used to green screen if you want to take an actor and put them on a different background. But another way you can do it, and I'm going to try and explain this, but it's a technique I wasn't familiar with, where you'll shoot a background of some kind, then take that same film again and shoot a, a character in the foreground on a dark background. So something like when the film is exposed, it only captures the light part. And then all the dark parts of the film, the original background that was there essentially shines through. So not the dark parts of the film, but the dark parts of what you're actually shooting. You know, something dark behind the actor. Or one that's a little easier to understand, you take glass, you draw something on it, and then film through the glass. So you can literally paint a background on it. And all of that stuff was done primarily by Francis Ford Coppola's son, Roman Coppola. But it has this very retro feel. 
And it reminded me of video games where sometimes I resent the fact that you had you know, 2D side scrollers 30, 40 years ago, and we've developed quote unquote better technology since then. You can make 3D stuff. And for a while it felt like, oh, everything's gotta be 3D now. But that's a false premise that the 2D side scrollers are an obsolete technology. But eventually you come around to the realization that's a different genre. It's a different style of game. Should we get rid of it just because we're able to make something more powerful? And so I've always loved the idea of go back to the limitations of that time, make a 2D side scroller, but with today's technology, see what new innovations you can bring. This movie, Dracula, does that for film because it's using all these techniques from almost a century ago but bringing today's thinking and innovation, what does that look like after you've seen a million of those movies a hundred years later and you're trying to do it again and, and push it forward? It, just, it works really well. Like I felt this movie was so, especially for the gothic time period, right? Like all these practical effects and stuff, it made it feel much more like a play. We've talked about how Coppola's, you know, really interested in theater. Like I loved the theater vibe for this movie and it also it doesn't it doesn't like take you out of it like i i found it more immersive is there's like a point where you're not trying so hard with the practical effects right where it's obvious that there's like you know shadow puppets whatever like it's obvious which kind of allows you to just buy into it whereas when they're trying to make it so real with the cgi the smallest bits of it that seem fake then take you out of the movie like i felt this really got you to just buy in with your imagination into the into the world of this movie. Yeah, I feel similarly when I watch the 1931 Dracula. That's a movie that you're not going to be scared watching that movie. You know Bela Lugosi, I want to suck your blood. That's in the pop culture. You've done the imitation when you were five years old before you even knew what you were imitating. The story itself, it's all done in a very theatrical way. And nowadays we're used to more naturalistic approach with filmmaking. But I love the mood and the atmosphere. And I think when a movie commits to a style, and back then it was a bit more of a, I think for that time, a more conventional style. Now it's more of a throwback. But when a movie commits to a style consistently, your brain sort of recalibrates to it. And so when characters are speaking more theatrically, when, when they're narrating, and when Ona Ryder is like, I realized my love could save us all, you accept it a little more. You go with it more. And there is, like you said, also the trick, the same trick Joker used, where because the movie looks older than it is, my brain processes it as more of a classic. And I'm more willing to, to work with it. If I don't get something, it's not that it was bad. It's, oh, I didn't get it. You know, it must be more. Now, to be fair, this movie genuinely is a classic by this point. But I think I would have approached it similarly if I watched it in the mid-90s. I'd be like, oh, this is a 30s movie. It's very important and special. But I've buried the lead long enough. I mean, you can probably tell from my tone already. I love this movie. Uh, and like I mentioned, for similar in similar ways, I love the 1931 movie, which is on vibes and mood. And it's just... Like, like the, the 1931 movie feels so nostalgic to me because it feels like it's a fundamental part of how I process Halloween today. You know, it's like a very specific slice of horror where, you know, you were earlier drawing the comparison between horror you like and horror you don't like. This is not the gory staring into the darkness of man's soul and you leave feeling dirty afterward. This is more like taking a little journey into the gothic and just enjoying this bizarre, strange atmosphere. And this movie, because of the way they handled all the effects. But on top of that, bringing in this surrealism, I love the idea that when you encounter something supernatural, suddenly the laws of nature shouldn't apply quite the way they usually do. You should feel very weird. Your brain just is like, I don't know how to process this. And Coppola found such a great way to capture that on film by just having very strange things happening all the time when Dracula's on screen. The way his shadow moves sort of independent of himself. The way there's this just weird soundscape behind him. You think you hear people screaming and moaning. Anytime he's on camera, just strange stuff is happening. I love that surrealism. I love, it's all shot on sound stages. 
So when you said it feels like a play, I mean, at points, it really does feel that way. And the stages, uh, the, uh, the sets are so well designed, the period piece aspect, all the costumes. This movie just takes you on a journey. I think the story can be a little meandering at times. And maybe that's partly intentional because it's meant to feel a little dreamlike. And there, but there are points, and we'll get into all the details where that sort of disconnected me a little bit. But what kept me engrossed the entire time was the look and feel and just feeling like I've stepped into this other world. And I felt validated in that opinion because uh, I didn't read all of Roger Ebert's review, but the headline was <laughs> essentially I love the look and feel of the movie and the mood and the atmosphere and everything. The, you know, story, story aside, you know, there's some weird stuff there. I, I read some of it. He, he brought up one example. You know, Dracula's plan is to buy these specific plots of land in London. And you're waiting to see the payoff of like, why oh, yeah. does he want, you know, Jonathan even asks him, why are you buying all those plots of land, sir? And I think that impression was as good as the one Keanu Reeves does in this movie. <laughs> and it kind of never comes back. So there's weird, and there's other weird stuff we'll get to where it's it's odd storytelling choices that you just kind of go with them because you're loving everything else in the movie. Uh, so yeah, overall, I loved it. I think from a story standpoint, some hit or miss stuff, but we'll we'll hit on that as we go into the details. Yeah, and before we jump in, I just had an idea for our own sort of horror, almost Saw-like movie we can make. You know, how would we really torture somebody? How would we torture you, Gil, on camera? What we would do is we would force you to not just read the headlines of reviews. You'd have to read the entire review. Yeah, and I'll just scream <laughs> as I feel all the ideas entering my brain. And how am I going to come up with my own unique thoughts? I'm just going to turn into basically chat GPT for movie reviews. All right. <laughs> Are you ready, Daniel? You must, before we begin this recap... You must enter freely of your own will and leave some of the happiness you bring. <laughs> ah. He knew. He knew. I don't know. I'm I'm a little scared. But just right, well, you're going to love this beginning while we part. Go in. <laughs> because this is this is history. You love you love history. Anything that happened before today, suddenly you love it. You're a history buff. <laughs> the year 1462. Constantinople had fallen. Muslim Turks swept into Europe with a vast superior force, striking at Romania, threatening all of Christendom. From Transylvania arose a Romanian knight of the sacred order of the dragon, known as Dracula. On the eve of the battle, his bride, Elisabetta, whom he prized above all things on earth, knew that he must face an insurmountable foe from which he might never return. However, he did return. He slayed many of his enemies and lived up to his nickname, the Impaler. But in an act of revenge, his enemies sent a false report that he fell in battle. Before he returned, Elisabetta took her own life. When Dracula gets back, finding his wife dead, he renounces God. He promised he would rise from his own death to avenge hers with all the power of darkness. He stabbed his sword into the cross and let it bleed into his chalice. He drank of it and pronounced, The blood is the life, and it shall be mine. What an opening, Daniel. And I didn't know you could do that. You could just like pronounce, I'm going to be immortal from now on. <laughs> but I think you have to be angry enough. <laughs> but I mean, this it's, opening, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, you love revenge movies, right? Like John Wick. Like there's something to, you're just so angry. And, and you're, you're pursuing vengeance so much that it gives you special powers. And so I know you must, you must empathize so much with the Dracula character of he's so vengeful and angry that God is forced to give him an immortal life. I think it's usually when I feel angry, it's, just, it's like an impotent rage. You just can't do anything with it. That's why I, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I think back to when I was a kid and like I used to get picked on and stuff. And I'm like, why didn't I just go nuts and like, Punch one of the other kids. <laughs> so I can't do that today. If I punch, punch, especially if I punch a child, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> but back then, you know, what's the worst that happens? You know, slap on the wrist. 
But today, if I get angry and I stab a cross, it's not going to bleed. And in <laughs> fact, again, I don't think that would be a good look for us. I think this podcast would be over tomorrow. The man seen <laughs> stabbing a cross and demanding to drink the blood that comes out of it. And when no blood came out, he became very upset. <laughs> But, I mean, the beginning of this movie, immediately, you start to see all the stuff yeah. you're going to love in this movie. The style. I just couldn't stop looking at his armor. That so red cool. Armor. I, I've never seen anything like it. I, I loved that armor. Yeah, and you start to see some of the throwback effects. Like, he's going into battle. So, you see his hand holding a sword in front of the map. All done so stylistically. And it's also just not something I expected. And uh, again, if I go back to the Dracula I'm most familiar with, the 1931 version, there wasn't much to the Dracula character in terms of an origin. But here you get this very emotional start. To some extent, it puts you on his side because who wouldn't feel angry in that case? After you went, almost got yourself killed, you had to commit all these atrocities. He had to impale all those people. He didn't want to do it. That part might not be true. Uh, But it, it sets up a more interesting start for his character. And that's one of the unique elements that this script brought to the story. It's been said many times that people think Dracula was inspired by Vlad the Impaler. This movie takes that and makes it a literal part of the story. And it adds this romantic backstory and and builds that into the movie. That was not there in the book. And it sets up some themes. Love, redemption, and some other themes that we'll get to. But what did you think of this opening, Daniel? I, I loved it. And I, I mean, I think it did a great job of getting, I don't know, I felt very much on Dracula's side after this, is it's total bullshit, right? Is he's going to fight for God, for Christianity, and he gets betrayed like this. Like, I do feel it's so unfair. And I, I deeply empathized uh, with his, with his anger. Uh, yeah, like, I, and I think, it sets up his character really well for the rest of the movie, right? Of this sort of more fallen angel, tragic hero sort of guy. Um, although he ends up doing some pretty bad things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's one in particular we'll get to. Now, to some, if, if I were the Lord, I would say to him, like, hold on. Like, number one, people to be angry at, they sent the false report that you died in battle. But, okay, they're your enemy. You expect that, but... And I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right. Elisabetta, I think. She sees a note and just jumps off the castle. Doesn't go to any other guard and say, you think this is true? Like, can we fact check this? And they they would tell her, just wait like a day or two before you do anything rash. I just think there's more blame to go around than the man upstairs. Or the the person upstairs. (laughs) London, 1897. Four centuries later, real estate attorney Jonathan Harker gets the opportunity of a lifetime. His firm services a particular wealthy client out of Transylvania by the name of Count Dracula. He was Renfield's client, but upon his return, Renfield hasn't been the same. In fact, you can find him at the lunatic asylum eating flies, ranting about his master who promised him immortality. The Count is buying up properties in London in particular locations for a very specific reason. (laughs) And to close the transactions, Harker must leave for Transylvania at once. Mina is reluctant to see him go, but he promises they can marry upon his return. Harker leaves by train, and Dracula sends a carriage to pick him up at the Borgo Pass. Its driver, a strange dark figure, inhuman, clawed, and the lands are teeming with wolves. And there's one great part where he's on the carriage. And he's like, sir, when are we going to be arriving? And he looks over the edge. And that carriage is so close to the cliff edge. It felt so uncomfortable. I feel like this scene, there's one thing this movie does. And there's a lot of things this movie does really well. But building up to something. So in this case, building up to his arrival at the castle. Just the mood, the wolves howling. This weird thing that grabs him and puts him into the carriage. The fact that he's so on the edge that he, you're afraid it's going to fall off the cliff at any moment. It fills you with dread of what are we going to find when we get to Dracula's castle. 
Uh, do, should we comment on Keanu Reeves, his casting? If I may inquire. What in fact happened to Mr. Renfield in Transylvania? I liked him in the movie. <laughs> I, so people criticize not just Ke they they especially criticize Keanu Reeves, but they also criticize basically all the actors except for <laughs> uh, Gary Oldman and Anthony Hopkins. But like I, I, I liked all the casting of. They do seem like they're all these like sort of young, bumbling people, right? Like they don't really know what they're doing. And, you know, of course, like Dracula's in charge. He knows what he's doing. And then Van Helsing knows what he's doing. Like, I, I liked the big age difference and even the, the difference in sort of like acting experience. And I don't know. I think like you got to always just like Keanu Reeves. Like, I, I think the other thing, too, is you just kind of go with stuff. I just assume whatever he's doing in the movie. I'm like, all right, like that's what he's supposed to be doing. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. I agree with you. So I, I will say, I think Keanu Reeves' accent, it doesn't sound good. Uh, and apparently, Francis Ford Coppola was talking about this, and he said that Reeves, he wanted to get it right. Like he, he tried so hard to get that accent perfectly down, and Coppola thinks maybe he tried it too hard. Like If he had relaxed a little bit, it maybe would have sounded more natural. But it honestly worked for me. Like The fact that it feels like... So he feels like a very naive character to me very naive and the fact that he that I, when i watch him i feel like i'm watching like a kid to try his best to do a british accent and he can't even talk well it even just adds to his naivete so you know maybe that's me just i feel like any other movie i'd be like this is terrible why did this actor is not doing a good job and maybe i'm being unfairly on this movie's side but it just worked for me i liked it and i agree across the board i mean I, all the cast I thought was great. And that's the other thing too, which is like theater acting is also not the same as film acting. And when you feel more like you're watching a play from like 80 years ago or whatever, it works. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go with that. <laughs> you have uh, Renfield. So Tom Waits as Renfield. Uh, you're probably not too familiar with Tom Waits. I used to listen to his music a lot. He kind of started out with more traditional folk music and got more experimental as time went on. And uh, he also does some acting here and there. And I think he does a great job as Renfield, as this deranged lunatic. Um, but it is funny, Coppola complains that a lot of his scenes get cut when this movie's aired on TV. But to be, to be honest, I can understand why when you're looking to cut stuff for time. Because I do, I struggled a little bit to understand the purpose of Renfield in this movie. And I, I do think there's stuff in this movie that's there because it's in the book and we're trying to do a faithful adaptation and it almost comes across more as homage. Like, remember this from the book? Now, I'm not saying Renfield doesn't have a purpose. You know, I think one of the main things it does is it raises the stakes for Jonathan Harker. We see somebody who went through working with Count Dracula and now Jonathan Harker is going. So we know... Maybe he's going to come out the other side looking like Renfield. I understand that from the beginning. But cutting back to Renfield several times th throughout the movie, sometimes it's fun to see. I think Tom Waits is doing a great job. But you'll see, for example, you know, Dr. Jack, I forget his last name, but he's studying Renfield. And he's like, what we could unlock, what we could learn from him. But that feels like one of those threads that doesn't really go anywhere. And then later, Dracula will come back, spoilers, and kill Renfield. And I'm like, oh, what was the point of his journey here? Uh, but I, I think he at least serves a, an initial purpose. You know, we talked about some of the journey to Transylvania. One thing I didn't mention in, in terms of some of those in-camera effects, when Keanu Reeves is on the train, I mean, it looks so great. You've got the dark train. He's almost silhouetted. Behind him, it's all red, and you just see Dracula's eyes. Yeah, and it's one of those things where I imagine if you were to, if I was going to say, if you were to write this story, I mean, they did write this story, right? Late, late 1800s, the original Dracula book that this is based on. But you imagine there's a, a feeling of dread. You, you know, you can feel something, you know, the hairs stand up on the back of your neck as you approach the presence of this darkness. How do you put that on film? I think you do it through surrealism. You do it through stuff that sets a mood, even if you can't logically explain every piece of it. You know, later, for example, 
Keanu Reeves will open a vial, at least a potion, and for some reason it's dripping up instead of down. Why is it doing that? It's just one of those things that adds to that unsettling feeling. The Shining did this a lot, where the hotel in The Shining is built in a way that's architecturally impossible. You'll have stairs that go nowhere. You'll have a TV that's turned on. If you pay close attention, you'll see it's not plugged in. It's all this stuff you will not notice while you're watching until afterwards someone goes back and points out, like, that window doesn't make sense. There's a window on the outside, but when you go inside, there is no window. But maybe it all subconsciously gives you this unsettled feeling. Uh, and there's one other thing I'll mention. You may have noticed there's a lot of narration where you'll hear somebody's journal. You'll hear letters. The book itself was written almost like a found footage because it's all journal entries, letters. So it's like you're reading this archival thing. So I, I did. I loved I loved the his journey into Transylvania. Like that's part of the, and all these little surreal, weird things like that's part of just the amazing world building of of the movie. The other thing. So Renfield, like totally, you could have just cut every single one of his scenes from the movie. And it wouldn't have affected the plot, but I do think the the asylum scenes with Renfield are just like amazing world building, and it it reminded me of sort of like Tim Burton style stuff. And what was that uh that movie we saw that I hated, uh, Wendell and Wild? Oh yeah. So, but like it, you know, because that has like monsters and all this weird stuff, right? Like the Renfield scenes, despite being live action, where it's like it's harder to do crazy, weird horror things, it felt more like the right vibe that that movie was trying to go for. Especially, do you remember those scenes where like his arms are in these like long sleeves that are like attached to the ceiling and he's kind of like moving like crazy like this? I thought like just so cool and just the like perfect gothic creepy vibe. I love the like cages that the guards are yeah. wearing around their head. At first, I thought they were inmates, and it's like a punishment. But rewatching it, those are the guards of the facility, and so I guess it's meant to protect them. So they all have these box cages around their head. At the castle entrance, Dracula invites Harker to enter freely of his own will, and he does. Despite the Count's strange manner and his shadow that seems to have a life of its own, Harker sees to the documents. Things take an even stranger turn when Dracula spots a photo of Harker's soon-to-be wife, Mina. She looks exactly like Winona Ryder, who looks exactly like his old wife, because they're both played by the same actress. She stirs in him memories of his own beloved wife, lost over 400 years ago. Dracula tells Harker to write some letters to Mina and his firm, announcing that he will stay here in Transylvania for a month. Perhaps under the Count's spell, Harker complies. So we talked about some of the strange stuff that follows Dracula everywhere. This is when you see the shadow that moves independently of Dracula himself. But it does this thing that I love, where it's a little more subtle at first, where I remember going through the journey, where I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That shadow is moving like on a delay, like Dracula will move and then the shadow will move. And then it becomes a lot less subtle toward the end of the scene where Dracula will walk over and then his shadow is like still on the other side of the room. And it made me realize something. So Alon and I just talked about Terrifier 3. And there's a scene in that movie where a dead person appears to the character, but it happens slowly where they're down to dinner and she just hears, hey, can you pass the rice? And you're like, wait a minute, who said that? And like, yeah, whatever. Then you hear it again. Hey, can you pass the rice, please? And you're like, wait, yeah, who is saying that? Because like, I'm accounting for everybody in the room. And it's like, hey, pass the rice. And it cuts over. There's a dead person at the table. And it made me realize that there is really something to a slow realization. It takes you through more of an emotional journey. It makes it so much more effective. So this is just a small example of that. It's a really cool idea. What if his shadow doesn't move with him? But even cooler is, what if you don't quite notice that first? And it takes you a little bit. It gives you a little bit more of that unsettled feeling. The uh, entering of your own free will thing. Uh, Coppola says on the commentary, and it's a well-known thing, it's well-documented, that a vampire really can't harm you, you know, when you enter their world, unless you do it voluntarily. 
Now, I hadn't heard that mythology in, in, you know, in the vampire lore. The one I'm familiar with is the one I know from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which is that a vampire can't enter your home, cannot cross a threshold without being invited in. But anyway, so in, th in this movie, though, it seems you have to kind of voluntarily enter his home, enter his circle, and now you can become his prey. Uh, but Coppola said that he was given the same advice about the mafia. The mafia gives you a gift, or if they want to talk to you, you stay away. And as long as you stay away, you'll be okay. <laughs> but he's like, even though I made Godfather, you know, one, two, and three at this point, uh, I, I've, I've always heeded that warning. I've never got, it's too late for you, Daniel. You're already part of this podcast. There's no escaping. <laughs> yeah, anything else to add here? No, I mean, I like, yeah, I like the slow buildup of creepiness with Dracula. I think uh, the creepiest part early on is when he does this uh, crawling across the roof. And it's crazy because yeah. he's got this like long, like, I was going to say dress. Like, he's, you know, his outfit has like a trail. It's like and a robe. It's like he's like slithering. Yeah, robe. He's like slithering across the roof. It's also just Keanu Reeves' reaction to all like i don't know when his shadow when his shadow is not moving with him and stuff and keanu reeves notices but he's just like oh this Whoa. is weird far <laughs> out <laughs> it is like there's so one issue with the movie i think is one issue i have with movies in general is that when characters are drugged or hypnotized and they're no longer in control of their actions if that goes on too long it can get boring because a story is characters reacting to things and making choices. But if your main characters are all zombies just being led to some predetermined end, I disconnect totally. And this movie has that issue where, I mean, Keanu Reeves is not acting the way any normal person would act in this situation. But I assume that it's sort of a hypnotism thing going on. He's under Dracula's spell because he entered of his own will. So it doesn't become a logical issue to me. But when I said the story could sometimes feel meandering, this is part of what I mean, where it feels like Dracula is the only person who is pushing this story forward in any way. If not for the amazing atmosphere and all the stuff I mentioned earlier that makes me love this movie, if all I was going on is the story itself, I think I wouldn't have loved it. I wouldn't have liked it because nobody's doing anything until and Van Helsing shows up. Yes, but then you have the same. You have the same issue with I think Eliz Elizabeth slash what's her Mina. regular Mina with Mina's entire arc because and I found myself kind of confused and thrown the whole movie, which is like, is she under Dracula's spell and that's why she's falling in love with him, or is it because of her like reincarnated past self Elizabeth that's still in love with him, or is the real uh? Her name again? Mina. I, or is the real Mina like actually falling in love with him, which I didn't really buy. But like that, that threw my whole understanding of her motivations and stuff out the window, which you're right. Then it feels like the only the only characters driving the plot forward and making choices are Dracula and Van Helsing. Yeah, which I think is uh, I don't know. I mean, I, to some extent, I think it's intentional. And I think it works because of all the other stuff they do to engross you in the story. Um, but yeah, with Mina and Dracula, we'll we'll get into we'll we'll get, we'll have a deeper discussion on kind of their love story. But I will say I found it odd. I was listening to an interview with the writer, and he was saying that they struggled with the ending because everybody's rooting for Mina and Dracula to be together. And I was like, not I I wasn't. Yeah, I was not rooting for that. <laughs> He also throws the word redemption around, you know, pretty, pretty uh, liberally. Like uh, there was an AMA actually with the writer on Reddit and somebody asked, you know, what is the theme of the movie Dracula? And he's like, love, loss and redemption. I'm like, okay. All right. We'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> oh, if, you, if you have something to say, go for it. No, what? Rede I don't understand what, what redemption does Dracula get? Dracula does a bunch <laughs> of bad things in this movie. And then, yeah, he's reunited with the woman he loves for some reason, she chooses sort of to be with him. I think probably because he sort of hypnotized her slash it's a past self of her, right? And and he starts to turn her into a vampire. So like, 
you know, he like abducts this woman who's a reincarnation of a woman he used to love. And then and then he gets to like ascend to heaven. At the and end. it's not like, like he decided, you know what? I changed my mind. I'm going to let you go. It's like, no, someone slit your throat and like stabbed you and you're dying. And you're like, you know what? If I'm dying anyway, I might as well be like, and by the way, I will set you free. You know, I'm redeemed. I'm like, eh. Wait, it did, feels he, like if we- <laughs> did he set her free from the whole vampire thing? Well, I think it's, I don't know if they say it outright in this movie, but I think if he dies, she's free. Yeah, but it's not like he chose to die. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. He didn't choose it. Yeah, it's, it's pretty convenient that you, <laughs> yes, you chose it once you no longer had any other option. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get to all that. Now, I, I will say I think her falling in love with him is slightly more complicated and, uh, and is a little more to it. But I'll save that. We'll get to it shortly. Well, yeah, he's a prince. Anyway. Yeah, exa- exactly. At home, he's a cool boy. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice reference. Of which there will be several more. Don't worry. At home, Mina and her rich childhood friend Lucy discuss the carnal pleasures she's hopefully soon to experience in marriage. An uncomfortable topic for the more sheltered Mina. That night, Lucy courts various suitors. Namely, Mr. Quincy P. Morris from Texas, the doctor, Jack Seward, and Arthur Homewood Esquire. Yet, there is also a dark prince. There is also a dark presence, as even from afar, Dracula casts his shadow here. It reaches out and whispers to Mina. This is another example of the eyes in the background as Harker is approaching the castle. Here, even though Dracula is still in Transylvania, you see him casting his shadow here at this party. It's another one of those things, you know, how do you visually represent, I can sense this danger looming, something is coming, and they use the shadow. And they use the shadow throughout the movie, and it's it's one of the things I love about it. Uh, I also, there's another theme kind of introduced here. Lucy finds Mina typing, you know, a typewriter, and she asks, is your ambitious John Harker forcing you to learn that ridiculous machine? Like, A, I just love the period piece aspect. W- later on, when they start to introduce a cinematograph, I was like, oh, this is awesome. I love all this. But I do also think there's a theme here. They come back to it a few times of just science, technology, progress. It comes up in various places where there's this new technology introduced. And it's sort of that versus this magical, mystical force. Uh, And I'll say more about that as the movie kind of gives us more to work with. Uh, And then, okay, on Mina falling in love with Dracula, I think they're already putting some groundwork for it here. You can see that she's very sheltered. You know, she opens up the book and sees pictures of people and doing disgusting things to each other. (laughs) And she's kind of like giggling and, you know... So you imagine this inexperienced person who meets someone with four centuries of experience. You could see what could be enticing about that. So I think there are seeds planted for reasons why she might be taken with this person. And then you add on top of that hypnotism and everything mystical that's going on. But I think there's also more to it. Yeah, and there's the theme, and you see it in sort of both Lucy and Mina, right? Of like Lucy's more loose and sort of embraces the sort of carnal side of things right and you see you know they sort of portray both these characters as like lucy has that inside her right and it sort of wants to come out and it's you know it connects like all the animals and stuff right is like there's kind of this theme in the movie of it's like there's this animal inside all of us that like wants to come out and you know dracula brings that animal out of her and maybe it's like uh release valve where it's not good to bottle it all up you bottle it all up you suddenly end up enthralled by an evil vampire you go to bed all bottled up don't be surprised if you wake up with a a bunch of she demons but by the way that's my other issue with and we'll get to that in a second but like lucy you know embrace like becomes a vampire and like embraces dracula and all this stuff but it's like She's hypnotized like she's very clearly hypnotized when she first goes to be with the wolf man. Now, I get later on, maybe she like kind of 
I don't know, but it just annoys me throughout the movie that like she's not really making choices. Yeah, why is that a, a problem? Or it, it's just going back to what I said earlier, where if because I think if too many characters are in that situation, that's when I start to have a problem. But if there is you know a character who's hypnotized, and then that becomes an obstacle other characters have to work through. You know, for Winona Ryder, it's like my friend is turning into a demon. For Van Helsing and everybody else, we're trying to cure this person. Was there something beyond that you're taking issue yeah, with? Yeah, because is part of that general issue. I think, at least when I heard some commentary about this, I think people were saying how, like, oh, Lucy's like a perfect recruit for Dracula because she is looser and, like, you know, she has these, like, looser morals and stuff, right? And I guess my point is it doesn't really work because it's not like, I don't know, you could have told the story differently, which is like, she falls in love with Dracula, like she's seduced by him and she finds out what he is and she's like, wow, that's cool. Like, I want that also. Like, I don't know, I guess thematically that would have worked. It would have fit more into that. But that's not what happens. Like, she just gets hypnotized. She's a victim. Yeah, I guess it depends on what theme you're going for. But it sounds like you're saying based on what other people have said, they're reading into a theme that you're disagreeing with. You don't think it's... I guess so. Yeah. I guess so. At the castle, Harker is starting to get a bad feeling about that Count Dracula guy. He realizes this castle is a prison. That night, he sets about exploring his confines. He comes upon a large bed cloaked in a peculiar mist. From it rise the Brides of Dracula. In that bed, he finds pleasure, but also pain, as the brides taste his blood. Dracula finds them in the act and forbids them from touching what belongs to him, Jonathan Harker. And Harker's just like, huh, what? They abide by his orders, but also want to know, will Dracula not feed them tonight? He does feed them. He feeds them a newborn baby. Where'd he get the baby from? Went into town. Maybe, I mean, he has all those uh, local people that are helping him. Maybe they have a deal. Like, look, we'll give you a baby. Once we get one baby a week, but you leave us alone. It's a lot of babies. Sort of like Game of Thrones. Yeah. Wasn't there somebody who was giving babies to the night? What are they called? The night walkers? The guy, the guy who ran one of those towns north of the wall would like yeah. give a baby, give his own babies. You know, he would have, he would have kids with his own daughters and then he would give the babies to the Night King. What a messed up show. <laughs> More, the, that's uh, mess, well, more messed up than Dracula. <laughs> there were a couple things in this movie that reminded me of Game of Thrones. Uh, when Lucy and Mina are hanging out and like giggling over that book, it reminded me of Alicent and... What's the main character's name? Oh, yeah. Nira in House of the Dragon. I felt like I was watching a scene right out of that show. But in all of this, you know, it, it really does feel like Harker's like, wait a minute, there is something off about this guy. And there is, they throw so much weird Dracula stuff at you. If I were to rewatch any sequence to kind of get in the Halloween spirit, it'd probably be this one because it's just nonstop weird Dracula stuff. He approaches Harker, who's shaving in the mirror, and this is where you see Dracula does not appear in the mirror. And I think that was shot in a similar way that they shot uh, in Terminator 2, a scene that got cut where, uh, the Terminator, he's like performing surgery on himself. And the, now I'm trying to even remember the scene. Oh, yeah, they, they, they couldn't let the camera show up in the mirror. So they had to like have a second actor that looks just like him, like mimicking his movements, something crazy like that. And then I think the scene got cut anyway. But here they had a, a body double and it's not a mirror. It's just something you can look through mimicking Keanu Reeves movements. And that's how he could not appear in the mirror. Um, but the other thing is Dracula like grabs his shoulder, Harker turns around, and Dracula's still standing by the door. He doesn't walk, he kind of like floats across the room, the door closes on its own, tons of weird noises, and then Dracula starts shaving him, <laughs> and I'm like, this is so uncomfortable, I'm waiting for him to like slit his throat and just start guzzling down blood. He does get a taste, because Harker cuts himself, and he just licks the blade uh, he leaves the room, and then, of course, like five seconds later, the shadow leaves after him. This is also when you just, for some reason, see him just crawling on the wall. Very <laughs> creepy. You see rats crawling on the ceiling. And then, yeah, you see uh, 
Keanu Reeves finds that vial and it starts dripping up. I just I love all, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I just I love all that stuff. And my favorite line in possibly film history. It was already my favorite line from the 1931 Dracula. Uh, but listen to them. The children of the night. What music they make. <laughs> but I love and so basically there's wolves like howling and all, stuff that we would typically say spells danger. But Dracula loves it. And Keanu Reeves is like, music? That awful stuff? What are you talking about? Um, but I love the difference in delivery. So there's the Bela Lugosi delivery in 1931 Dracula. And then the, I keep wanting to say um, uh, Walken, but no, no, Oldman. The Oldman uh, uh, delivery. He goes, listen to them. The children of the night. What sweet music they make. He does this like kind of, he kind of throws away with a giggle that last line. And so just knowing how it sounded in the 1931 version and how it sounded in my head all this time, hearing that, it just made me laugh. But I still love it. Listen to them, children of the night. What music they make. Listen to them, the children of the night. What sweet music they make. And it's the kind of thing you could only say in this movie in a more naturalistic movie something you do a, a traditional movie you'd watch today if someone suddenly went listen to them huh <laughs> children of the night what sweet music they make You're like shut up why are you talking like that but you know this movie commits to that theatrical tone and it gets to say awesome stuff like that Gary, Gary Oldman is so good. I mean, with the, first of all, like his super, you know, this really weird Dracula costume with the weird hairstyle and stuff and him like sort of like behind Keanu, like romantically like shaving him. I was dying in that scene. <laughs> Just again, the, 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 naive, the naivete of Keanu Reeves being like, this is weird, right? Like it's not normal. <laughs> He's telling his friends like, and then he shaved me. I'm like what? <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought that was weird, right? That's not, like, normal, right? <laughs> uh, oh, one of the brides, Monica Bellucci, probably most well-known for Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Oh, right. Yeah, I, I'm just kidding about that. That's not what she's most well-known for. <laughs> but uh, there will be another, don't worry, another Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice reference coming. Uh, so... Dracula and his brides eat a baby. How do you come back from that? I mean, that is unequivocally evil, right? And then Harker, it, this is when he finally breaks from his spell. Like, okay, I thought it was weird when he shaved me. <laughs> his shadow, I mean, I've never met, I can't say nobody's shadow does that. I've never met someone. Maybe in Romania, shadows work differently. I don't know. But definitely eating a baby. And you can see he's just like, oh, 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 like the most over the top, like horror. And I'm not criticizing that. I mean, if anything calls for over the top shock and horror, it's this. And then Dracula laughs at him. And I, I did find myself just contemplating the nature of evil. Dracula is evil. But what form of evil is he? Because he doesn't strike me as somebody who wants to go around and, and do awful things. But he's laughing at Harker here. And so what the vibe I get from it is obviously he's angry at God. He feels totally betrayed by God. And so I think he's not looking to do terrible things, but he doesn't care. I will do them. And I assume as a vampire, maybe the younger they are, the more vibrant the blood and the better it tastes. So if it tastes better, yeah, I'm going to go for it. I don't care. And then when Harker has this shocked reaction, I think Dracula's laughing at him. He's just laughing at man on this stringent moral path. And Dracula knows it's for no reason. You're trying to please this higher force. It doesn't care. So I mean, two things. One, it's just funny that it's like, who, whatever, God. I mean, the poor baby, right? Is <laughs> Who cares? You know, it's just funny. Is like, you know... You know, the, the baby's the victim here, not God. 
But then the second thing is like, th- this is the same issue that uh, no, 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 you know, I- Dracula's the victim. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'll say no more. Go on. So, but this is the same. I, I can't remember if we talked about this. The issue that J.R.R. Tolkien had with the orcs, right? Is you know, don't you feel bad for them? Like they don't. They were created to be these monsters. Like, do they have no choice in the matter? And if they have no choice, they're not really evil. Do they deserve to die? You sort of have the same issue with vampires generally is like they live off of blood, right? And they crave like baby's blood and stuff. Now, I don't know, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, other things, they get around that by saying like, well, they can subsist off animal blood, but they choose to eat humans. And that kind of gives you that option. Um, But yeah, I don't know. I guess like Dracula made a choice, like he renounced God and he chose this sort of evil path. But I guess like other people, he turns into vampires like. It's kind of unfair. Yeah, well, you assume for them. I mean, at least I assume for them, it's like kind of a cheat, but it's the hypnotism thing where Dracula's evil infects them. So to me, it feels like they have less of a choice than he does. Yeah, so I guess it's all it all fundamentally comes from his evil, right? And that's theoretically his redemption at the end if he renounces evil, which he doesn't really, so. Right. And his evil comes from a very angry and emotional place which i think is where it typically comes from it's not you know there's different types of villains there's the logical with quotes around it villains like you know thanos like he's come to a quote-unquote logical conclusion that i have these magical things that can do anything we don't have enough resources and so i have to kill half of all living things so we have enough to go around it's like could you not use it to create? I mean, but you could fix that with one line. You can't create matter. So he's not going to be able to make... Maybe he was right, actually. I don't know. Coming around to this, uh, Thanos was right. Um, Dracula is an emotional villain. Uh, he comes from a very angry, vengeful place. And that's what I think motivates his evil. And love, also. In London, Mina is disturbed by Jonathan's letters informing her of his extended stay. They are cold and unlike him. But there is also good news. Lucy has accepted a marriage proposal from Lord Arthur Homewood. The mood turns dark when a storm approaches, brought on by the approach of the Demeter, the ship Dracula has stowed away in for his trip to London. The captain's log notes that each night more of the crew goes missing. They believe there is something sinister on their ship. Dracula arrives on the coast of London in a bestial form, and in the storm, he hypnotizes Lucy into a carnal state and infects her blood. Now, one one moment of the uh, sort of theatrical acting that didn't work for me is that Mina and Lucy are having a very serious discussion. Mina's like, I'm really worried about Jonathan. I don't know what's going on with him. These letters are not like him. And then suddenly they start going like, <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what just happened? It started raining. And they find it like, this is awesome. Like they, they're so happy all of a sudden and just the switch. And then there's another switch like five seconds later. They're like, well, that is too much rain. And then they start to get worried. Uh, but just that moment really struck me. You know, uh, I don't, I didn't notice that for some reason. I, I don't remember. They must've done something to kind of transition. No, is that, well, I didn't notice it on my first watch to be fair, but watching it the second time, I was like, wait, what was that? And I went back a little. It's just as they're talking, it starts to rain. And it, because, I don't know, maybe the fidelity of my screen, I, I couldn't quite see the rain at first. So it just looked like a totally random mood switch. And I was like, what the hell is this? I'm really don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and they now, do just start frolicking through the rain. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it doesn't rain that often, but that's just, that's never been my... I don't want to say never. Sometimes I've been outside and it starts to rain. And if it's like really hot and the rain is kind of refreshing, I will frolic a little. (laughs) Now, a couple of things to note here. So on the ship, Dracula's hiding out in a crate. Really cool shot where he looks almost embryonic. And I think what's happening here is he's, when he arrives in London, he's going to look a lot younger. Maybe this is how he transforms. He has to kind of cocoon for a bit. And then, of course, he's feeding on the blood of everybody on this ship. And I assume having all that blood also helps him to sort of regenerate his younger self. He also has a bunch of crates of dirt from his castle. 
uh, earlier in the movie, Harker even mentions in his journal, he's like, for some reason, every day, they keep loading these crates with earth. Later, Van Helsing will explain that he must rest in the sacred earth of his homeland to gain his evil power. So he's got to bring all that dirt with him to London. So question, you know, I always wonder with these mystical beings, you know, do they just innately know, like, you know, like an animal instinct, like, I need my dirt. Or is it like, look, somebody's got to explain it to him because, you know, maybe he'll just sense weakness and he's just going to try all these different things. He's like, all right, I tried sucking a bunch of blood, still feel weak. I tried pig's blood. I tried virgin blood. I'm trying all this blood. Nothing's helping. Like he just keeps trying stuff until he figures out the dirt. Like how does how does he figure it well, out? Well, it's funny you say for mystical stuff, but what about for human stuff? <laughs> like we we had to figure all this stuff out too, right? It's true. You know, it is funny. Like you know, humans obviously you need water, right? Like you get thirsty, you're like, ah, like I want like a liquid. No, but even that, like, okay, I'm the first human. I'm, I'm thirsty. I don't even know yeah. what thirsty is. I'm something. <laughs> <laughs> I need something. I'm, wait, let me try eating dirt. No, that's not doing it. Ah, okay, that, that fire over there. Ah, okay, I can't drink that. Uh, I don't even know what drink is. <laughs> so that's true, right? And it's different. Like animals do. They just automatically do whatever they need. But you're right. Humans, we need to like figure it out. So I guess, yeah, I guess for vampires, it's the same way. It must have taken them a while to figure out the dirt thing. He's been around for 400 years. Yeah, at some point, it's been, let me try... I know this is weird and everyone's kind of, he's like, it's the equivalent <laughs> of like, okay, if you're, you're like a dad and you have a beard and then one day you decide to shave it and you walk out all uncomfortable and everyone's looking at you, that's Dracula. All his brides are like, what are you doing? He's like, ah, I'm going to try sleeping in the dirt tonight. I just have a feeling like, uh, and then he but starts you know, to explain himself. He's like, you know, people, when they were first around, like they were thirsty and they didn't even know what thirsty was. It's kind of like that. And like, what are you talking about? You've been drinking some absinthe or something? The green fairy? <laughs> you know, imagine too, just figure out the blood thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, the, he kind of came up with that. He was like, I drink the blood. Blood is the life. Oh, yeah. He's sort of like, he's thinking back to that. He's like, why didn't I say anything else? I could have said water is the life. My job would have been so much easier, but but like he didn't know that in that angry moment he was setting all these rules for himself. He'd have to abide by for oh, eternity. But you know why I think it is the blood is the life? Well, my theory, I don't really hear anyone say this anywhere, but you know, at least with the Christian stuff, right? It's the blood of Christ, right? They drink the wine and it's the wine turns into the blood of Christ. And that's your, I guess, taking communion with God or whatever. Yeah. But please so, don't state that in this like uncertain way because I'm ready for all the comments like, these idiots, they don't get the whole blood thing. We're, we're joking around. Like we, we get it. I th we're not. The cross we're was not bleeding. Christian. Mary was bleeding. I'm, I'm doing my best to understand it. Yeah. Can I say that? <laughs> I'm just Go kidding. Ahead. What did he say to him? He's like, <laughs> he sees his cross. Dra Dracula sees Jonathan Harker's cross. And he's like, don't bring that you know, stuff over here. This is Transylvania. Things are different here. You know, it, <laughs> so we're in Transylvania over here. In Transylvania, it's normal to shave your friend's neck. <laughs> He's like, okay, what else is normal? <laughs> uh, more surreal stuff. So the ship on the way in, it's like swaying like a ship does. So now the camera is swaying. When it's looking at Mina and Lucy playing in the rain, the camera is going nuts like it's on the ship. We're at the zoo. All the animals are going crazy, and the camera is still doing more of this. And, of course, at the asylum... Renfield could not be happier. His master is returning. He's so psyched. Not going to work out for him. Which he really gets... Like what... Okay, Dra Dracula's redeemed. He treats Renfield like crap. He made him all these false promises about immortality and then just leaves him in the jail to eat a bunch of bugs. And then later he kills him for betraying him. And it's like, you betrayed him first. What were yeah, your plans yeah. for him? Did you even remember he existed until he, you know, betrayed you? So unfair also, right? Like, Dracula's never met Lucy. Lucy's done nothing for him, right? But he gives her eternal life, right? He won't do it for Renfield. It's just because Renfield's not a hot young girl. That's why. It's not fair. That's discrimination. Yeah. Accurate. Though, I don't know. He seemed to... Well, yeah, I know Jonathan Harker. Yeah, he didn't really... He didn't convert him either. Contrary to some beliefs... The vampire, like any other night creature, can move about by day. 
though it is not his natural time and his powers are weak. I love this moment because that narration doesn't need to be there. But you know Coppola, this is just like Dracula getting in the dirt. He's very uncomfortable. Coppola's about to show a Dr uh, Dracula walking around in the daylight. And he's like, puts this line in there, just spoken by, if you look at the subtitles in the closed caption, it'll, it'll tell you who's speaking when they're off camera. So it'll be like, you know, Jonathan Harker's journal, Mina's letter. Here, it's just narrator, which tells you we need to tell the audience, like, yeah, I know the whole thing, you know, vampires can't go out in the light, but we did some research and we found there are some, yeah, they can walk around in the light. All right, so go with but it. But I like, hey, I like the narration, though, because I do think it's, it's your guide to this world. And like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to wonder. So he's explaining it to me. Like, I. I liked it. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really have a problem with it. It just made me, <laughs> it just made me laugh because I'm just imagining, I, I'm like seeing through it, you know, I'm seeing why it's there. All the narration, by the way, that isn't one of the known characters like Harker or Mina, uh, you know, the captain's log, that's all Anthony Hopkins, which is also fitting because I feel like, and he's not playing Van Helsing in that moment, but it does fit the Van Helsing vibe. He's the professor. He's the one who knows everything. Anthony Hopkins also just amazing in this. I loved him. Yeah, I didn't mention it when I was talking about why I love this movie, but he is a big part of it. He is so good. And we're going to get to that shortly. In the day, Dracula walks the streets. He finds Mina. He introduces himself as Prince Vlad, and he charms her. Together, they take in a demonstration of an amazing new technology, the cinematograph, one of the first film projection technologies now rising in popularity. He takes her aside and they share an intimate moment. She could swear that she knows him and he assures he has crossed oceans of time to find her. He moves to bite her but can't bring himself to do it. While Mina enjoys the company of this foreign stranger, Lucy gets a visit from Dr. Jack because she isn't feeling herself. Her senses are growing stronger but she's having nightmares. The eyes. But... Jack cannot figure out what's wrong with her. At a loss, he cables his teacher and mentor, one Abraham Van Helsing, the metaphysician philosopher. Quick complaint here, really bad doctor. Okay, so first of all, I used to be an emergency medical technician, right? Not a doctor, very basic medical stuff. But, you know, one of the first things you do is you inspect somebody from head to toe. You figure out like, hey, somebody's really sick and weak. Maybe they have internal bleeding. Maybe they have a wound. Like you check everywhere. She has two bite marks on his neck, on her neck, but she's wearing a collar so he doesn't notice it. Like, no, I had the same thought. I had the same thought. Do you want to finish your rant? Sorry. No, that's the end of the rant. What? He, yeah. I think there's a throwaway line at one point where, he, where uh, Van Helsing mentions the bite marks and he's like, yeah, yeah, the bite marks, but where's the blood going? So yeah, she has two bite marks, but he's not finding a bunch of blood on her sheets or anything. But that's after Van Helsing. Van Helsing is the one who sees the bite marks. Right, right. Okay, my understanding is that he did already see them. And so when Van Helsing points them out, he's like, yeah, I saw that. If he didn't see them, I agree with your criticism. Okay, okay. Now, a couple of cool, very cool stylistic choices. So when Dracula is first walking the London streets... They use a hand-cranked camera, the exact same type of camera you would have used when you were shooting silent films, you know, literally a century ago. Or at this, I, no, sorry. At, at this point, a century ago from today's perspective, when they shot this movie, it would have been almost a century ago. Uh, and it just does one little extra step to help immerse you in this world. Because we know that if you were shooting a scene in the late 1890s, it wouldn't look like if you were to shoot something with today's camera. They don't have that technology back then. So shooting on an old camera, I think it does something to help place you in that world and for a second make you feel like, yeah, this happened. In like 1897, Dracula showed up and he was walking around London. And I just love hearing the shouts, the cinematograph, see this new wonder of technology as a film, as a film person, a film buff. And as somebody who last year worked on a history of horror video where I went all the way back to the origins of film and learned about the cinematograph. And one of the things I was going through, I was trying to find archival footage or 
images that I could bring in to show what these parlors looked like, where you could actually see the cinematograph on display. It was hard to find stuff. So to see this recreation of what it might have been like in the late 1890s to walk in, and, and back when movies were magical, and they were actually treated as such, you know, oftentimes at, at that at that time, they were really a novelty, you know, magicians would work with them. And it was just the excitement of seeing something move on the screen. But it was just, you know, this movie aside, you just give me that scene, I would love this. And then, of course, it's more on that theme of technology and progress. And I do love, I guess, I, I, don't, I, I don't know that I can put my finger on this well, but you, you probably can better. But <clears throat> like experimenting with these different film techniques, right? Like using old school film techniques, but in the modern day, right? And then showing us what film looked like back then, like literally showing us footage from a hand crane camera, but then putting us in the cinematograph place, like all that stuff, it really, it does a good job of like enabling you as the viewer to actually really engage with this theme of technology, right? Is It's not just like telling us a story about technology, like it's really, I don't know, it's really helping you connect with it and placing yourself sort of in history, right? Is like seeing your modern day of like, you know, like I'm watching this on this TV with like through YouTube, right? Like, I don't know, like it did just kind of make me think about my place in this history of like the, the technology I have access to compared to them. I don't know, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, just, it, it's, it, it's a really cool, it was a really cool technique. Well, yeah, it's like if you want us to think about the progress of technology, what better way to do it than take the technology that you must be using right now because you're watching the movie and showing you an earlier form of that very technology, it helps you to very distinctly draw a line between like point A and point, you know, B, C, D, E, F, G, you know, wherever we are right now when you're watching this. So I think it, it makes that idea really concrete of progress. And uh, it is also like for them at the time, it was this excitement of a new technology and this immense curiosity of what it's going to be. And now for us, we're feeling a different kind of curiosity. What was it like? So it puts us on a similar playing field as them, feeling something similar. Funny moment here. Dracula says, well, you know, wow, there are no limits to science. Winona Ryder, how can you call this science? Do you think Madame Curie would invite such comparisons? Another Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice reference. Winona Ryder herself, her character, her, her character's daughter in Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice goes as Marie Curie for uh, Halloween, scientist who discovered radioactivity. And another Beetlejuice thing, because uh, in this scene, when Dracula kind of grabs Winona Ryder and they sort of float away, you know, they used something on the ground, like something they were standing on to, to move them. Probably Winona, Megalon. Yeah, they're probably using Megalon, right? <laughs> when, I was thinking everyone would get that reference, but we're one of like two uh, out of 10 people who have seen that movie, Megalopolis. Well, when Owen Ryder said to Coppola, oh, I've done this before. So I think in Beetlejuice, when she was working with Tim Burton, he used a similar technique at one point to have her kind of float. You see more weird Dracula stuff, like when she first meets him, and she's like, good day, sir, and walks away. He's still he's standing in front of her. He's essentially teleported. And he's not the only one who can teleport. We'll get to that soon. Don't worry. Um, now, there's also... So there are moments where you feel empathy for Dracula. You know, we mentioned the beginning, but by this point, now you've seen him eat a baby and you've seen him do these awful things. But there's a little bit of a cheat here where you no longer feel like you're looking at the same person. They almost become two distinct characters. There's the old man, awful Dracula, who lives in his castle. And then there's dashing young Gary Oldman who charms Winona Ryder. Uh, so I think... I say cheating, you know, as, uh, I'm kind of joking with that, but it does help you to get some of your empathy back by making him look totally different from the person who did those awful things. Wait, 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 wait. but not really, because within minutes, he's attacking Winona Ryder, like he's about to bite her and all this stuff. Yes, I, yes, but that, that's a turn the scene takes. But yeah, coming yeah, up yeah. to that point, I mean, that line, like I've crossed oceans of time to find you, and so much tragedy and sorrow in the delivery of those lines. I think it's impossible not to feel something tug on your heartstrings. And okay, so going back to what I was saying earlier, 
I think it's a little more complicated than he just hypnotizes her into falling in love with him. I think, yes, that plays a role, but I like that they don't make it just easy. Of uh, you know, the 1931 movie, they'll just cut to like a close-up of Bela Lugosi's eyes staring at you very intently, and he's essentially hypnotizing you. But here, okay, there's the seeds I mentioned earlier. If she's a bit more sheltered, so having this person who can show her a whole new world is going to help. But on top of that, he's isolated her from Jonathan Harker, her husband. So she's feeling very alone and vulnerable. So in that state, he shows up and he is a very charming person. He's confident. He's a prince, but he's also very humble. He has fast reflexes. He catches that vial she drops. Uh, So I think when you add that all together, you could see why she would feel some attraction to him. And then you add on top of that, He's a vampire, and there's something mystical at play as well. Add on top of that, that she may be the reincarnation of his wife. You know, that's why she'll have these moments of deja vu. You know, somehow I know you. So to add to that, you know, we talked about this idea of, you know, Keanu Reeves has to walk through the barrier willingly into, into Dracula's castle to then become his victim. This is sort of what I was pointing out thematically with, like, Dracula putting Lucy under his spell and putting Mina under his spell is that like you I think it's more interesting when the character gives in willingly to some extent right and you know it just occurred to me that I guess Mina does do that in this scene right is even just like the slightest bit but she does open the door just a little for Dracula which is she's about to walk away from him but then she turns around and says, like, you know what? I've been rude. And they talk some more. And then she goes like, oh, a prince, no less. Right. And she is of her own free will. Right. It doesn't really seem like hypnotism or anything like she is slightly intrigued. Mina is intrigued. Right. And then that does open the door to whatever hypnosis, reincarnation, whatever, everything else. But I do like that. Like she does kind of take the first step herself. Yeah, and I buy it too. I think it happens gradually enough where at first, like, do you know my husband? And he's so humble. He plays it up so much that she does start to feel guilty and starts to open the door just a little bit. And then, boom, reincarnation and all that. And, and now the reincarnation thing. So, you know, I was trying to think thematically. So, the writer will say this movie is about love. Okay, so what is it about love? What is it saying on that topic? And at first, when you realize okay, she's played by the she, she's the same actress who plays his wife. She's having these moments of deja vu where she feels like she knows Dracula. If she is his wife reincarnated, does that mean they are meant to be together? And does that to some extent validate Dracula pursuing her? And despite the fact that she's to be married to Jonathan Harker, definitely doesn't validate him kidnapping Jonathan and locking away in his castle. That's off the table. But and killing the baby. Her, and killing the baby. Yeah, well, don't worry. The redemption's coming. <laughs> but I, I was thinking, you know, what does that say about love? I think part of it is that love is not just two people. It's also the time and place. It's not just who two people are. It's also time and place. Because, A, people change. So maybe at, at some point, these two people were meant to be together. At some other point, maybe they're not meant to be together. And when I say meant, I'm not talking in a mystical fate, destiny sort of way. I mean, compatibility. Are you two people who can successfully share a life together? So people change. And maybe 450 years ago, you were meant to be together. Maybe Mina shares some fundamental similarity with Elizabeth. In this world of reincarnation, what does that really mean? Okay, it's the same soul as returned, but grown up under totally different circumstances. Uh, it's, it's sort of like nature versus nurture. So yeah, you crossed an ocean of time. I can feel bad for you and sympathize with that fact, but it doesn't entitle you to now be with Mina. So those are just kind of some yeah. of the thoughts I had thinking about love. And- you know, the other the other point, and I think this is a common theme in sort of vampire movies and stuff is, you know, vampires, this this thirst for blood they have, right, is obviously portrayed in a lustful way often too, right? And it's like, you know, this lust they have and what it drives them to do, 
right? In the case of Dracula, it's like this love he has that drives him to do a lot of bad things, right? It's his love for Elisabetta in the first place that causes him to renounce God, right? Like, I do think this is a theme here is the in intense power of love, not, as, not always in a good way, right? It drives people to obsession, to craziness, to doing horrible things, and sometimes hurting the person they love too, right? Like, you know, in the case of, you know, and of course, I, I wouldn't, I don't think you really call that love, right? But th this is, you know, thematically, right, people, the, the obsession that like Dracula has for Mina, right, causes him to do very bad things. Um, yeah, I think just that's the other point. It's just like sort of the toxic power of obsession. Yeah, agreed. Left behind in Transylvania is Jonathan Harker, kept weak by the devil women feeding on his blood. But tonight, he will try one last time to escape. Meanwhile, Van Helsing arrives in London. He wastes no time with Lucy, even performing an experimental procedure, a blood transfusion to save her life. And he identifies her condition. She is becoming a vampire. Now, there's some stuff in this movie that really reminded me of The Exorcist, which is my favorite horror movie of all time. And one that I think may bother you, it's quite disturbing, but I think you have to watch it at some point. It's so expertly made and so effective. Um, but one of the moments that reminds me is uh, the arrival of Van Helsing. There's a shot of him standing outside with his bags, and there's an iconic shot in The Exorcist where it's a similar idea. We're dealing with this demonic force. We need the big guns. We need Father Marin. And when the priest arrives, you see him holding his suitcase or his bag outside. And it's this iconic shot. This really reminded me of that. And then later, when Van Helsing is trying to subdue vampires, yelling, you know, Latin prayer at them, they're vomiting blood on him. I couldn't help but think of The Exorcist, you know, in a good way. I didn't actually hear... Uh, Coppola mentioned it, so I don't know if it was coincidence or if there was any deliberate homage or inspiration. Uh, I also like when they show Lucy kind of like writhing around, it'll intercut with these microscopic images of blood cells. I loved that. Yeah, and it, it's, it takes the theme of technology sort of meeting this mystical force. It makes it very visual because it's sort of like in Star Wars, I and mean, everyone hated this. But in the prequels, George Lucas started to try and scientifically explain the force. Up to this point, it's been this mystical thing. And now it's like, well, you have a midichlorian count in your blood cells. And the more you have, the more in tune you are with the force. But here you have somebody infected with vampirism. And now you're seeing the blood cells. And the movie doesn't start doing that until Van Helsing shows up. And so it makes him feel like this force of rationality inserted into a world that thus far has been irrational. And he really is the counter to Dracula. What we were talking about earlier, every character here, here feels like they're under some kind of spell. Dracula is the only force moving the story forward, but now there's a counterforce, Van Helsing, and it feels like, okay, enough messing around. Let's have an actual plot here. I'm going to start moving this story forward. And, you know, in a big way, Van Helsing... Van Helsing is also kind of like amoral, right? In that he seems much more motivated by just his curiosity, right? And this is sort of in some way like the amoral element of science, right? Which is science can be used for good or evil. Like he's just a character who's just fascinated. And he goes at some point on a rant about we are dealing with Dracula, the immense power, right? He's speaking in awe. And then he's like, and of course we we have to we have to get rid of him. He's, he's dangerous. But like you you almost see that as like an afterthought, right? Van Helsing is just he's so amused and intrigued by what's going on. He is he's one of my favorite characters ever. I mean, immediately Anthony Hopkins, he plays this character so well. And I was just writing down a list of stuff I loved about him. But number one, it's always nice to see a competent character especially after an hour of incompetence. Uh, and so to see him just walk in calm, collected, it's like in a movie where you bring in a fixer, like Mike Ehrmantraut shows up and they just know what to do. So those characters are immediately likable. But then on top of that, he has this sense of humor about everything uh, where, okay, so Arthur is doing the blood transfusion and he's like, I would give my last blood, drop of blood to save her. 
And Helsing is like, your last drop, thank you. You are very welcome here. I don't ask as, as much as that. Not yet. You know, just like <laughs> kind of laughing at the fact that this guy's willing to kill himself to save her. He also, you know, it can cross the line into amoral territory, but he does have a very genuine passion and curiosity. He really wants to learn. He's so excited to face this unknown thing. And on top of that, he's always teaching. He doesn't tell them she's turning into a vampire. He asks questions. He gets Jack there by saying, where's her blood going? And Jack's like, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it should be blood all over his bed. Like, what are you saying? Someone's coming in there, drinking the blood and running away? He's like, yeah, why not? And so he <laughs> leads him to the idea that he's a vampire. So it's just, oh, I also, he has superpowers, I, I think. Oh, Can yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was going to, I actually, I couldn't help myself. Like near the beginning of the movie, when Van Helsing shows up, like when he does, like he teleports. <laughs> he teleports. I Google. I'm like, wait, is Van Helsing a vampire? He's not a vampire. But I was like, I was like, maybe I forgot that that Van Helsing is a vampire that fights vampires. Yeah, he's. Uh, so Jack refuses to believe the impossible, and then <laughs> Van Helsing goes, "Do you not think there are things in this universe which you cannot understand and which are true? Mesmerism, hypnotism." materialism astral bodies and as he's saying it his voice gets kind of echoey and like wait, wait where did he go and he pops out from behind a rock and so it's like he teleported to prove like yeah there's weird stuff out there <laughs> but here's what i love so this theme of science and progress it's not just that look at this technology it's there what is it saying about it when science meets this supernatural force it kind of shows there's nothing beyond the realm of science. Van Helsing is able to bring it all into a set of rules. Even if you can't explain the fundamental nature of vampires, you can't explain their supernatural uh, nature and where they come from. But through rational deduction, you can identify the work of a vampire. You can figure out that there is a vampire at play here. And you can start to break down the rules. You can look through these ancient texts and figure out how to fight them. And then even when you talk about religion, okay, that's not science, but scientifically I can identify using a cross, using these particular prayers is going to subdue that vampire. So I think this movie, it kind of shows you an interesting way that the supernatural and the scientific can be integrated. And it's very positive. I think it's very pro technology and science and showing you nothing is beyond its grasp and it can be used to protect us even against these mysterious forces and of course the technology theme shows up here with the blood transfusion and there's there's also just a fun element to it it's just fun to see what did a blood transfusion look like in the late 1890s when it was this brand new thing i was worrying though i was like he didn't even check his blood type but yeah but apparently I guess back then they didn't know. So transfusions would sometimes work and other times a person would start vomiting and get sick because he gave them the wrong type of blood. Also, I love the way they depicted the technology, the transfusion, right? Of like, there's the pump and it goes into the bottle and then the bottle sucks it up. Like that was the old Gothic tech is so cool to see. Yeah. Mina spends more time with her new friend Vlad and partakes in the green fairy, Absinthe. And Mina describes Vlad's homeland in great detail, as though she's been there before. She even describes the princess. Her face is a river filled with tears of sadness. When Mina cries herself, Dracula catches the tears and turns them into diamonds. And in another river, in Transylvania, Jonathan Harker makes his escape. While Mina and Dracula dance, he crawls through mud until he finds the good sisters of the Blessed Sacrament. He takes refuge there. They write Mina a letter, this one with Jonathan's usual warmth. He fears for her safety and wants her to come here at once. Here she'll be safe and they can get married. She does not want to leave her ill friend Lucy behind, but Lucy won't hear it. She tells man, uh, Mina to go, be with Jonathan, and Lucy lies to her friend. She tells Mina that she's gonna be all right. She is not all right. She's already grown retractable, sharp teeth, fangs. She already thirsts for blood. I love the absence scene. 
when they're Dracula and Mina, they're eating in this dark room by a window. And through the window, it's just a fog and you see silhouettes of people like dancing. And you see a lot of the similar tricks where the images of his homeland will appear next to her while she's describing it. It's all very strange. So you almost feel as drunk as they are in this scene. You definitely see Coppola's experimental side, which comes back in full force in Megalopolis. This is the scene of Adam Driver like drinking over and over, mm. and, like the bottles flying around the room. Uh, and you see, uh, I think what I was saying earlier, why the two of them might fall in love here, why Mina might fall for him. Harker is gone. Lucy is not herself. So Mina's only friend isn't there. She's very isolated. And in a way, this room to me felt isolated, but the only source of warmth is Dracula and her together. So you could see why, you know, again, this is like a cult leader, you know, isolate you from all your friends and family until I'm the only person you have in your life. But it does work, even though it is uh, terrible and manipulative. Is that, wait, is that why he turns Lucy into a vampire to isolate Mina? I don't think it was meant to isolate her. I think it was more like if I'm going to turn you into a vampire at some point, you're probably going to want to have your friend around, especially if we're going to be together for eternity. So I think it's twofold. It's like one, he's always looking to expand his uh, harem, his brides. So why not Lucy? But also she's a good choice because it'll make it easier for Mina to be with him if her friend's going to come along for the ride as well. Oh, that reminds me. Another thing we didn't talk about was when he was in his wolfman form and he was on top of Lucy, you know, the first time Mina sees him and he goes like, oh, don't look at me. Right. He's ashamed that he's, you know, he's in this wolf thing devouring, you know, her friend. Right. He's ashamed of this. Then later, though, when he's in his young form and he's, you know, there to pursue her, he says he goes like, look at me. Yeah, and I think it was uh, it was like hypnotism. He was saying, don't see me. And I think she literally doesn't. And then in the crowd, he says, you know, see me, see me now. And she does turn and notice him. Uh, we see more of the reincarnation idea. She knows the homeland. She remembers the princess. I mean, it would seem like in the text of this movie, she is the reincarnation of his wife. I think that's, I don't think that's a, a point that's, is she or not? I think she definitely is. There's a moment where as she's describing the princess, the princess appears on screen next to her. And then seeing the two of them literally next to each other, played by the same actress, it's she's the reincarnation. Absence by or, the way. Oh, go ahead. Well, you know in Groundhog Day, how he doesn't get out of the Groundhog Day situation until he falls in love and, and she falls in love with him, like the woman he's meant to be with. And that gets him out of the Groundhog Day. So maybe it's like Dracula couldn't end his damnation on Earth until he fell, you know, until he, he found the woman he loved again. And so maybe he's like imposing all these memories and everything on her. Like he's kind of forcing it onto her. He's cheating. To allow him to play out his sort of redemption arc. He's like, I'm done looking. I'm just going to take this person and groom them to be my wife and try and trick whatever mystical force has trapped me in this Groundhog Day scenario. That's what's exactly. going through Vlad's mind at this point. Yeah, I, think, I think you're probably spot on. Uh, absence, by the way, uh, is a highly alcoholic spirit, but it used to have a lot more attached to it. It was thought of as a hallucinogenic. It had all these very mystical and exotic ideas attached to it. So this scene really leans into that. Like, oh my God, we're going to have absinthe? But nowadays we know it's just very high alcoholic content more uh more great van helsing stuff uh i love that old vampire book that he takes to learn about dracula now first off you spell vampire with a y i'm on board as soon as i see that i'm like oh this isn't a vampire this is a vampire <laughs> and when you say nosferatu i'm even more on board so He's looking at the book, Van Helsing, and he's like, yeah, Nosferatu. And then you read some of the awful things Dracula did, and he's like, yeah, Dracul. It's him realizing, like, yeah, this is what I thought it is. 
And it's just, I just love it. And I love the old book where you have to kind of unlock it and open it up. And he reads about some of the awful ways that Prince Dracula killed his enemies. Impaled people, roasted people, boiled their heads in a kettle, skinned them alive, hacked them to pieces, and drank their blood. But th- this is also what you mentioned. He is so psyched. He's like, this is, yeah, this is Nosferatu. Yeah, yeah, this is Dracula. I can't wait. At the news that Mina is leaving to marry Harker, Dracula cries tears of blood. By the way, there's apparently, this is one of those articles where I'm like, there's no way this is true, but some people studied letters from hundreds of years ago from Vlad the Impaler, and they studied like residue on the letters, and they say, we found evidence that Vlad may have suffered a condition that caused him to cry blood. There's no way, because you know they so want that to be true. There's no way they were able to like scrape something off these letters and find evidence of that. But it's cool. Though Mina vows never to see Vlad again, she misses him already. Surrounded by candles and crying more from a face that's turned monstrous, Dracula shouts, winds, and a storm overtakes the city. Van Helsing goes mad with excitement at the prospect of this undead foe. But tonight, they fear Dracula will come for Lucy, so Arthur stands guard by her bed and Quincy outside. Van Helsing promises they can save her soul, but not on an empty stomach. I starve. Feed me. He leaves for dinner with Jack, and that night, Dracula does come. While Mina and Jonathan marry in Romania and have a grand old time, Lucy dies in London, but it is only a temporary death. Soon, her living death and eternal hunger for living blood will begin. Did you like Anthony Hopkins going absolutely nuts in the rain? I- he starts, do you remember as he's describing who Dracula is and how excited he is, he grabs uh, Arthur, I think it's Arthur, and he starts like humping Arthur's leg. <laughs> do you remember this? Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Like I enjoyed it on a visceral level of like it's just fun to watch Hopkins let loose like this. <laughs> but it's so over the top. And I think that was a common criticism because on the commentary, Coppola gets defensive defensive about it. He's like, people had a problem with this. And like, what do you want? You you've seen Dracula a million times at this point. You just want to see the same old thing. I'm trying to do something different. Well, also remember the rain makes people go crazy, and it was raining in that scene. That's true. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I like I like the idea of Van Helsing being excited about facing Dracula, and we've seen little bits and pieces of it. But here it went it, it went maybe a little too over the top for me. But I'll admit it is fun to see just Hopkins let loose like this. And it doesn't totally break the character. It just it's like the dial for me maybe could have gone back. 20%. But I love the intercutting between Lucy essentially dying between that and the marriage. And it's always fun to draw that kind of contrast. It's a trick similar to playing happy music over an awful thing happening. But it adds this sense of tragedy where they're getting married, they're happy, but they don't know what's waiting for them when they get home. Mina's closest friend is dead, maybe worse than that, undead. They're also not really happy. I mean, uh, you know, Harker is like very ill and Mina is like kind of just going through the motion. She's like, yeah, I'm supposed to get married to this guy. But like, I really miss Dracula, my prince. Yeah. Harker's hair has turned gray at this point, either from the sickness or all the stress. I I do feel bad for him. He does feel like he plays... He becomes sort of a supporting character and it, he feels just very unfairly treated. Uh, and it, it kind of goes unexplored, like the dynamic between Jonathan and Mina. They have been through a very bizarre situation. Mina has fallen in love with a monster and Jonathan has just spent a month in bed with a bunch of she-devils. How do they come back from that? Do they come back from that? To some extent, it feels like, no, they're sort of going through the motions, but they do get married. She's putting in the effort to make it happen. And who knows, at the end of the movie, are they going to stay together? 
That feels oddly skipped over, even though I know that's not the focal point of the movie. But that that, that, that did just feel... Something about it felt strange. And I do think it affects the movie negatively as you get toward the end, the last 20 to 30 minutes, when it does become a slightly more conventional movie, where it's us versus the monster. And what's at stake? It's can these two lovers destroy Dracula and be together? But that isn't there. I, I'm not necessarily hoping for that yeah. outcome. I don't know anymore. And why did, why did they get married? Like, it's odd. Like... I don't I don't get why that happened in the movie and I don't really get why she goes to Transylvania and then comes back. Well, I think she knows that Dracula is not good for her, that she does still even if she's not feeling it as much anymore, she knows I was in love with Jonathan. No, I get I guess I get why she does it, but I don't get why they wrote that into the movie. Like it just if it, it feels like a I don't know. It's sort of like the the plot is not progressing in that direction. I guess this is kind of what I mean. It just feels like it meanders there and then it comes back. Like, did that need to happen for the plot of the movie? No, I I think that's fair. I think this is some of the oddity in the movie where I think if it wasn't there, it would feel like it's missing. I'd be like, what's they were supposed to get married and what Jonathan and Mina, they're just not going to talk to each other anymore. It would feel very odd if it was left out, I think. But to what I was saying earlier, I don't think it goes far enough. I think there was more to explore there. So when it gets stuck yeah. in this middle point, then you start to feel meandering. That makes sense. There's uh, more strangeness with Dracula. One thing I love about him in this movie is that almost without rhyme or reason, he's just constantly changing form. And so here when he's crying, his face looks more bestial. It's not quite Wolfman form. It's something in between. And then there are times where the way he changes is doing it to fit a specific scenario. I'm attacking, so I'm going to turn into a giant bat. But just the inconsistency, if he can look different from one scene to another, part of what I love about him. So part of why that happened is so Gary Oldman and Francis Ford Coppola got into like a few arguments on set. Generally, there were just like some tensions. And Gary Oldman was... uh, Coppola basically says partly it's it's Oldman's fault like he made things harder for them for him than it had to be because he went to the costume designer and started working with the costume designer to create all these extra costumes himself whereas Coppola only planned to have him in a few and so Oldman had to constantly be putting on these complicated different costumes and it made all these scenes more uncomfortable Uh, and so that made the tensions go higher and Coppola basically said that it's like that was Gary Oldman's fault. (laughs) You know, I know how Coppola feels feels because, you know, we've never had a <laughs> studio where we can just sit down and comfortably record a podcast. There's always some, uh, what's the word where you have to kind of give up something and meet in the middle? Compromising. So all the time you guys are complaining, it's too hot in here. And I'm like, well, we can't turn on the AC. There's going to be noise in the background. These chairs are uncomfortable. Said, Buy a better chair. Grab a pillow. You know, it's just like old men. Like, why do I got to put this costume on? Because I have a vision, old men. If that is your no, old man. But but also it was Oldman's choice to put on the costumes. Whatever. <laughs> you didn't yeah. listen to my anecdote. <laughs> well, I, I got distracted thinking about an anecdote I heard where some of the details are fuzzy, but I think it's the scene where they come in to rescue Mina. She's lying on the bed and Dracula kind of stands up in this man bat form. And says, you come at me with these trinkets you can't stop me. And when they were rehearsing the scene, Oldman's just standing there in his underwear. And he's like, because they were in bed together. And he's like, I'm not intimidating. This is stupid. This is a, this is a stupid scene. And uh, Coppola <laughs> gets so annoyed and he shuts down the set. And he's like, fine. Uh, I'll let you know tomorrow if we're going to keep making this movie or not. <laughs> and so everybody panics. Everyone's calling their agents. Like, I think, I think maybe we all got fired. I, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> And then Coppola shows up at uh, John or James Hart's hotel room, the writer. And he's like, what if he's a giant bat? And they had discussed early on not having Dracula turn into a bat. Because as soon as you do that, it's cheesy. And he's like, yeah, okay, not a bat though, but like a big bat. And that's how they came up with uh, the man bat form. Which I thought worked really well, actually. That scene ended up working well. He's this grotesque, disgusting. Wait, oh, this might be a different scene because there's like the final showdown where he's in that grotesque, like almost spider-like, but still bat-like 
figure, you know, where he towers over everybody else. Yeah, in the in the room where uh, where he's standing on the bed, right, with Mina behind him. Yeah, yeah, that's the scene I'm talking about. And I, I think oh, that okay. was, in terms of horror and actually making you feel horrified, I think that was probably the most effective scene in the movie to me. Yeah, and Mina's looking at this grotesque monster, thinking like, "Ah, my love." I love you. You're way better than uh, Harker. He has gray hair now. He gets a little scared and his hair turns gray. At Lucy's funeral, Van Helsing quietly inquires with Jack, hey, once this funeral thing's all done, can you grab the post-mortem knives? An autopsy, really? No, 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 I just want to stab her in the heart and cut off her head. <laughs> Jonathan and Mina return to London. When Jonathan sees him, Dracula somehow grown young. And that night, despite Arthur, Quincy, and Jack's skepticism, Van Helsing takes them to visit Lucy's grave. Sure enough, when they open her coffin, she is no longer in it. She returns to her tomb with a little girl in hand, perhaps a late night snack. They rescue the girl, and with the help of a cross and a prayer, Van Helsing coaxes her back into the coffin. Finally, they put a stake through her heart and cut off her head. Now, there's one guy on YouTube that in the comments who has repeatedly criticized me because he hates any time I use the term somehow. So he would hate this example here. You know, he sees Dracula somehow grown young. He takes issue with it because he, he's like, somehow is not an explanation. And oh, yeah, it worked out great in Rise of Skywalker. Somehow Palpatine came back. But the difference is... In Rise of Skywalker, they didn't really explain how he came back and somehow is the only explanation. But I use the word to get into the character's point of view. When you hear somehow, I'm speaking from Jonathan's perspective and that's what he's feeling. He's like, how is this possible? Okay, so I just want to address that. Uh, so, <laughs> so you see that? If you comment, this is an encouragement for you to comment because even if you're one person, we cater to this whole podcast and channel to you. Yeah, leave a comment and you might get an angry, vindictive reply from Gil. Van Helsing, more of, I just love Van Helsing. You know, th there's the exchange I mentioned in the recap where, you know, autopsy. No, 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 I just want to stab her heart and uh, cut off her head. And then here, as they enter her tomb, Arthur, a gentleman, must we desecrate poor Lucy's grave? She died horribly enough, Van Helsing. If Miss Lucy is dead, then no wrong can be done to her. But if she's not dead, well, what are you saying, man? That she's been buried alive? No, all I say is she's undead. Undead. Just a very matter of fact. And he knows. He's got this little smile. He knows the things he's saying are shocking. And he loves the fact. He's like, look how casually I'm saying it. I also just can't help but appreciate these three guys, Jack, Quincy, and Arthur. They were all competing to be Lucy's husband. But, you know... No jealousy. Now, to be fair, they're like, hey, she picked Arthur. Jack and Quincy are probably like, oh my God, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Dodged a bullet. But you know, no jealousy between them. They're all working together. And it made me realize there really are no bad guys in this movie other than Dracula himself. But all the human characters, everyone's trying to do the right thing. The only difference is in their knowledge levels, their ability levels. And it feels very old fashioned because I remember having the same thought when I watched The Thing from Another World, this 50s movie. It's an adaptation of a book, I think, or a short story, I think, of the same title, but it was later adapted by John Carpenter, The Thing with Kurt Russell. But The Thing from Another World, Alien is attacking, and it's just a bunch of people competently working together. Nobody's backstabbing each other, just working together to try and stop this monster. And it felt good. It feels like today, if you were to do a take on Dracula, there would have to be the one character who's like, wait a minute, if we capture Dracula, we could use his blood to create super soldiers. I'm going <laughs> to grab her and use her as bait. And there's going to be some just straight up evil person. We didn't really have that here. And I appreciate it. You got to like, and you got to just like a movie where it's like a group of bros going on an adventure to fight evil together. I remember thinking when I was in like middle school, high school, I was like, I hate the world we live in. I wish we lived in another reality where I could say, Daniel, like, you know that vampire that's been driving us nuts for like the last three years? 
until this weekend. Let's grab some steaks. Let's go on an adventure. We're going to go to the castle. We're going to stab him in the heart. Quests. I want to go on a quest. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm saying. Van Helsing sits to dinner with Mina and Jonathan. Jonathan tells the doctor that he knows where Dracula sleeps. He's the one who brought him here to Carfax Abbey. And then Van Helsing gives essentially the Baba Yaga speech from John Wick. He builds up this Dracula villain. This is what he says word for word. Vampires do exist. In this one we fight, this one we face has the strength of 20 or more people. And you can testify to that, Mr. Harker. But he can also control the meaner things of life. The bat, the rodent, the wolf, Daniel. He can appear as mist, as vapor, as fog, and vanish at will. Now all these things Dracula can do, but he is not free. He must rest in the sacred earth of his homeland to gain his evil power. It is here that we must find him and destroy him utterly, Jack. Love that speech. Love the buildup. It's like I said earlier, when he's going to the castle, you hear the wolves. You see over the cliff, you're afraid he might fall off. And it's building up to this great evil he's going to find in the castle. And now as the movie's coming to its end, we get another buildup. Now we're going to go face this demon. Daniel's like, demon? I thought he was a vampire. I was speaking metaphorically. Van Helsing and the men prepare for their battle with darkness, while Jack takes Mina to his asylum for protection, where she meets the deranged Renfield. When he betrays his master, he warns Mina to stay away from Dracula. At Carfax Abbey, the men begin their exorcism, destroying every box and sterilizing the earth inside, leaving Dracula no refuge. Dracula himself watches from the ceiling, in the form of a man-sized bat, before he turns into green mist and pays Renfield a visit. He knows of his betrayal, and he smashes his head into the bars of his cell to kill him. What was his betrayal? Telling Mina to stay away from Dracula. I think that's what he's referring to. It happens right oh, after that. Oh, and that's because he's basically jealous of Mina. You know, it's funny. I, the first time I watched it, I read it as a moment of lucidity where Renfield is being kind to her. He's saying, stay away from him. He's dangerous. On second viewing, I was like, wait, oh, he's jealous because Dracula is so into Mina. And what about me, poor Renfield? So he's trying to tell her to stay away. Uh, more Van Helsing stuff I love. As they're walking into Dracula's grounds at Carfax Abbey, Van Helsing tells Quincy, your bullets will not harm him. You got to cut off his head. I suggest your big knife. Then Quincy goes, well, Doc, I wasn't planning to get that close. And you just hear Van Helsing. <laughs> he finds it so funny. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a great moment. I think not much else to say in this moment other than we see some other. We've already talked a little bit about his man bat form. I think it's his most horrific one, even more than the Wolfman one. For some reason, this one's a bit uglier and meaner. And actually, going back to that story I told you earlier, where they were afraid that Dracula turning into a bat would be too cheesy, and they were, they were trying to decide on the design of this bat. And Coppola asks the writer, you know, what does a vampire see when they look in the mirror? And he explains that they see the darkness and awfulness in their soul. That's why they hate to see mirrors. And Coppola says, yeah, that's what his face needs to be. They tried to capture that, that, that horribleness. And I think they did. Dracula next visits Mina and confesses to her his true nature. There is no life in this body. He is Dracula. Mina hates him for murdering Lucy, but still she loves him. In fact, she wants to join him in undeath. He cuts himself so she can drink of his blood until he realizes he cannot curse her to the same eternal life that he is suffering. But Mina makes the choice herself. She drinks the blood. The men arrive just then, and Dracula takes his man-bat form. With their crosses, guns, and prayers that corner him, he turns into rats and scurries off. This is the moment we talked about earlier where I think Dracula is at his scariest. He towers over them. You think you can destroy me with your idols. It's a bit of an 
impotent rage, to use that term again, because, uh, yeah, they can. In fact, you ran off of a, a bunch <laughs> of rats. You, you got scared and pushed into the corner. <laughs> this is also, I mentioned earlier, this is where the movie, I feel, starts to become a little more uh, conventional. You get less of the surrealism, and it just becomes a game of cat and mouse. We're trying to find Dracula, catch him, and kill him. A uh, cool oh. bit of behind-the-scenes stuff from this scene. So uh, I watched the behind-the-scenes footage where Coppola basically was trying to get the character, just the vibe in this scene, right? And so he had all of the, you know, the characters besides Dracula who are about to confront him blindfold themselves. And then he had uh, Gary Oldman in his costume go around and just trying to scare them for a few minutes like whispering creepy things in their ears and touching them and stuff. And then they refilmed the scene and it had much more of the vibe of the tension and the creepiness that he wanted. I always wonder how effective that stuff is because I think if you, even on this movie, if you listen to some of the actors who were involved, they're like, yeah, Coppola did some weird stuff with the whispering. I don't know that we needed to do that. <laughs> I think there's differing opinions, but you also can't argue with results and whatever he did, it worked. I mean, it, look, it looks it works great on screen. Watching Mina per Professor Love for Dracula here, uh, I mentioned it already. I guess we've already talked a decent amount about this, but it just feels so weird to me that the dynamic between Jonathan and Mina doesn't get explored further. They've had this horrible thing happen to them where he spent all this time with the vampires and she's fallen in love with Dracula. And I just want to know more about how they work through that. Uh, but th there is a great moment, I uh, kind of skipped over it before, but when Van Helsing is at dinner with them, he asks Jonathan, so uh, during your infidelities with these uh, vampires, do you, ever, uh, do you ever drink their blood? He's like, no, 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 no. Like, okay, good. Then you're not uh, infected like, uh, like Mina and uh, Lucy. <laughs> uh, he's, I was thinking... You know, Jonathan, you never see him upset at Mina. So I think to his credit, he recognizes that there was mystical and non-mystical manipulation from Dracula. I would imagine he'd be like, Mina, I turn around for two seconds and you fall in love with the monster. But then I think he sort of just feels, she's let me off the hook for spending a month in bed with those women. So maybe I should just... Uh, Keep my mouth shut. And in fact, when Van Helsing has that exchange with him, like, you know, during your infidelities, Mina doesn't look angry at him. In fact, she puts a hand on him, like, don't worry, you know, I'm, I'm with you in this and there's no judgment. So I guess both of them have to be sort of judgment free toward each other. But again, it's an interesting dynamic. Would have been cool to see more of it. Dracula has left them, but Mina is becoming like him. She's turning into a vampire and has a strong psychic connection to, Va to Dracula. Van Helsing uses that connection to their advantage. He hypnotizes Mina so they can track him down. They find that he's traveling home by boat to regain his strength. So they rush to cut him off, heading in the same direction by train so they can get there first. But the Black Devil is reading Mina's mind. He knows their plans, and he evades them. Plan B. They split up. Van Helsing will head with Mina to the Borgo Pass, try and reach Dracula by horse before he gets to the castle. He'll bring Mina with him. The others will still pursue him by boat, or they'll still pursue his boat, but they have no success. Dracula reaches land and is now on the Borgo Pass road. Come nightfall, Van Helsing and Mina make camp, and through her, the brides call out to Van Helsing. Mina seduces him, and for a moment, he gives in. He kind of starts like, his head starts moving around. Like he's very physically being hypnotized. He's like, yeah, when I kissed her, I was uh, hypnotized. I would never do that. But before Mina can sink her teeth into him, Helsing wards her off by touching, I think it's a sacred wafer, to her forehead. The communion, a, the communion wafer. Yeah, exactly. The communion thing you eat, yeah. He creates a circle of fire to protect him and Mina, and he wards off the brides. Really easy to make a circle of fire, by the way. I don't think it works that way. Like, you just take a torch, and you go in a circle, and then a fire just stays. He I don't know how probably he got that going. had 
I think he probably put some oil or something around them earlier. He was like, just in case we need this. He was planning ahead. So when he lights it, it all lights up. Is what I'm going with. Uh, I already mentioned that I do feel like the movie becomes a little more conventional to me at this point. It's just us pursuing Dracula. I don't think that's necessarily a problem, but it didn't fully work for me here. Because the thing that drew me into this movie is the surrealism. It's hanging out with this weird Dracula and just seeing all the different effects in this other world. But when you go to a cat and mouse chase, I feel like you need the tension of, are we going to stop him? Oh no, he knew we were coming. He changed his plans. Okay, now we need to try again and change our plans. But none of that is actually milked for tension. In fact, most of it is purely kind of bored Keanu Reeves narration. We tried to stop him, but he went a different way. So then we went a different way. We tried again, but then he went that way instead. And I also but it is think, fun seeing the map and stuff. I like that. Oh yeah, that stuff is cool. And it's also kind of what I mentioned before. Dracula, he talks a big game, but we've never actually seen much of a show of force from him. He's, he's scary on the surface, but when I think about all of these people going to attack him, I'm like, I feel like they have a pretty good chance against him. They think they can win. And even when you think about Dracula in his prime, all the Vlad the Impaler stuff, it's ancient history at this point. And we actually never really saw it other than puppets and shadow figures. I've never seen Vlad going out there, being a badass, showing the power of 20 people. If not for him eating that baby, he really wouldn't be that scary a guy. Uh, so I don't feel that much suspense in this sequence because I feel like the odds are against Dracula. And kind of what we said earlier, where it's what are they fighting for? If there were more love between Jonathan and Mina at this point, or I was really rooting for them to have a chance to be together, if we spent more time there, you know. So there's not enough for me to root for, and there's not enough for me to fear. And again, you might say it's not what the movie's about. Okay, well, if it's not what it's about, we spent a decent amount of time on that sequence here, and I start to disconnect a little. You know, the other random thing, I was a little confused by the motivation of those three guys. Like, I get what Hark why Harker's there. And I get why Van Helsing is, but what, the other three guys, I mean, I guess one of them is sort of avenging Lucy's death, I guess. The other two, like, I, I don't know. I just didn't really get, it didn't really bother me, but I didn't really get why they were going on this adventure. It's just a thing guys did this back is, in the, the day. This is the quest. I want to go on a quest and you're always like, look, that vampire's not bothering me. Sure, he ate a bunch of babies last week. They're not my babies. Why am I going to bother going on that quest? They're just doing the right thing. They know they got to stop Dracula. Right, I'm question. sorry. I'm sorry. Finally, Van Helsing reaches Dracula's castle before the Count's arrival. He beheads the brides, tosses their heads off the castle, and yells, Dracul! Several times. Kind of reminded me of Rocky. Uh, Rocky IV, he runs up to the top of the mountain and yells, Drago! If we ever go on a quest... I definitely want to incorporate going to a high point and yelling the name of our villain. Daniel! <laughs> Come sunset, Dracula approaches. And now it is a race against the clock. Jonathan and the other riders close in behind him. But if they cannot kill him before the sun sets and it becomes dark, the task will be much more difficult. Dracula will be at his strongest. Just as the sun falls, Dracula bursts from his crate. Jonathan cuts his throat, and Quincy stabs him in the heart. Mina takes the wounded Dracula into the chapel, into the chapel, the same place where he renounced God 400 years ago. Jonathan tells the other men not to follow. Their work is done. Hers has only begun. They turn around to see that, though Quincy landed the final blow, he himself was severely wounded in the battle. He's dying. Inside the chapel, Mina thinks to herself, There, in the presence of God, I understood at last how my love could release us all from the powers of darkness. Our love is stronger than death. Give me peace, Dracula asks. She stabs him in the heart, cuts off his head. Mina looks up at a painting of Dracula and his wife, bathed in light. The end. He's redeemed. 
<laughs> yes, yeah, so I don't. I don't really get it. <laughs> All right. Well, what part? Oh, the whole thing. No, I. So her love is more powerful. So it's her love. What? What is her love? What good thing does her love do? I think. I will admit. I hear these lines, and it does feel a little. I do raise an eyebrow. It takes me a second. Where I land is, I think her love is so strong that she's able to let go of her love. She pities Dracula through her love enough to cut off his head and end his misery. Yeah, and I I guess in a way, his love is what allowed... He allowed her to get close to him because of his love for her. In fact, he went to London and all this stuff because of his love for her, which eventually led to his death. And so it's like, in a way, that is love conquering evil, ultimately, where like he is the evil. And love started it, the loss of love, and then rediscovering this love, you know, over 400 years later, is able to bring him back. In terms of redemption, I think cinematically, I feel redemption being communicated through the screen because you see what was a monster returning to human form bathed in light and then dying it, it it screams redemption if i dig into the story has he been redeemed i mean i don't think so he's never confronted that he's done awful things i guess other than the fact he says give me peace that seems to be a recognition what i've been living is not life i've been living a tortured existence Why is it tortured? I would think a big part of that is because I'm doing awful things. I'm working on behalf of the devil. I've been living an evil life, and he wants it to end now. So I I think the way I read it in the end is, yeah, love, the loss of love sent him into this darkness, rediscovering his the reincarnation of that love, you know, four centuries later, it brings him back. It seems to be the first time in a long time he's decided to take human form walk in the light and i think he starts to see the good in humanity again this is the first person he's probably connected with you know since he lost his wife the first time and that's that's when he says you know give me peace and end this horrible existence now to be fair like we like we were kind of joking earlier but if this all worked out where he was able to be with her i think he would choose that but i imagine eventually he would realize that what he's gotten is not love. It's not the pure love he had with Elizabeth. Love with Mina would be one where she was coerced, manipulated. She's a vampire. Can I say I love somebody if I've cursed them to a doomed existence where they have to drink blood? I think it would be an empty love for him. And so I think recognizing that and saying at this point, better to die, is some degree of redemption. Maybe I've talked myself into it. Maybe I'm seeing the redemption here. Yeah, uh, I guess so. <laughs> no, like cinematically, there's redemption. <laughs> uh, so, okay, I mentioned that I didn't feel a lot of tension in the pursuit. I did feel some for sure when you see the sun setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was, yeah sun setting, right? As the sun's going down. That's so cool. Just visually, it's getting darker and darker. They're chasing the wagon. Can they get him in time? Would I have felt more tension if Dracula felt more dangerous? I think yes. But in either case, it came through to me a bit. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we've reached the end here. Oh, there's a great line I have to mention from uh, Van Helsing. when he tur- His last line in the movie. When he turns and sees Quincy dying... Dracula's gone to the chapel. Okay, he sees their friend is dead. He goes, we've all become God's madmen. All of us. Just God's madmen. What an amazing phrase. What does it mean? What it says to me is we have done this insane task on God's behalf. We just killed a vampire. That's insane. And we really took great risk to ourselves. One of our friends has died. We're madmen. We're God's madmen doing this in his name. You know, that's the other thing. It just felt unfair that Quincy dies at the end. And it's like, you know, I don't know. Dracula gets this like sort of happy, peaceful ending. 
like and Quincy has to die like that. That felt really unfair. Yeah, but it happened no, in the book. Life isn't fair, right? But some this isn't life though. This is a movie somebody wrote that's capturing <laughs> the fact that life is is unfair. But I mean, th- that oh. is some of the stuff that chips away at the idea of redemption, because <clears throat> yeah. I don't know. You want to see some recognition of like, okay, all right, so you're dying. You want peace. You know, you can't go back and apologize to all the people you killed. But actually, Quincy's bleeding out right now. He's not dead yet. So if you want to go apologize to him, you can do that. You could shout through the doorway. He'll hear you. Like, hey, sorry. Sorry, Quincy. My bad. Jack goes, yeah, no, just give me peace. Give me peace. I will. I'll give you peace, but you got to apologize to Quincy. And Dracula's <laughs> like, does that thing where someone uh, rings a doorbell and like you're someone goes, someone's going to answer and you're like, okay, I'll get, oh, okay, you got it. <laughs> so Dracula's like, okay, I'm going to, oh, he's dead already. Okay. I was going to apologize though. And what was the line of, you know, our work is done. Hers is just beginning. Well, I think she now, she's still under his spell. She has to go into the chapel with him say goodbye and and let go of him because i think she was not willingly going to leave him and and go with jonathan like she had to go in and kind of finish the job and and for her the job is more emotional it's not just go kill this monster yeah there could have been more to explore there because that's like john sort of letting mina go and then hoping she'll come back but like it just yeah that relationship yeah it just like wasn't explored yeah and we've talked about it a bunch it's probably one of the main things i find odd in the movie um but yeah i mean i still i i I would like to watch this got me in the mood for some good gothic stuff i'd like to watch some more gothic things this was fun i would love to watch the frankenstein after this the 94 take with robert de niro yeah that would be a great kind of pairing so maybe we'll do that oh yeah i think that's it right do you have any other words that you haven't said yet about this movie I don't know why I phrased it like that. I'm in the Dracula mindset. Do you have any more words to share on the matter? I got plenty of words. Uh, hey, I watched a video last night that you would love. Cinemassacre did a comparison mm. of which Dracula movie is most faithful to the actual book, Bram Stoker's Dracula. And how do you think this movie ranked? You know, I watched that video, I think, oh. a year or two ago. It, it is a great video. James Rolfe gets so obsessive about it. He goes through, I mean, dozens of Dracula movies and will score them all. Which one's It's very Dracula you. Book. It's very you yeah. because he does it analytically. There may be some influence there, I'll admit. I, one of my, uh, my Halloween video, I, I was, so I struggled with YouTube for a while, you know, especially transitioning from speaking contemporaneously to starting to do some scripted stuff. And I couldn't find my voice for how to read a scripted content in a more natural tone. And then I started watching, you know, I loved Angry Video Game Nerd, but then discovering Monster Madness and all the James Rolfe just talking about movies he loves. I was like, I really like the way he talks. So I listened to a bunch of Monster Madness before I went and recorded my Halloween video. And then like the second comment on the video is, anybody else, uh, does this guy remind anybody else of James Rolfe? <laughs> Um, but yeah, okay, how did this movie score in terms of accuracy to the book? I mean, Second. I, oh, you were going to answer. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, I don't <laughs> remember in the video where it landed, but just based off what I know, reading about this movie, I was going to say, I would imagine it ranks pretty high up, but but it's, so what yeah. was number one? This was number two? Second slash very close. I forget. I didn't pay attention to any of the other movies. There were 12 of them that he was ranking. So I think it was a 1972 Dracula film. And this came number two, very close second, easily could have been first. However, that, that's because it had a lot of the most major plot points and characters included, but it also had some of the biggest departures for the book. Mm. For example, the whole love story between Mina and Dracula, not in the book. Yeah, I think I mentioned that at the beginning. There's a couple of major new elements this brings. Like that plus the fact that he is literally Vlad the Impaler. Yes, I think that was a great choice, though, the love story. It, it makes the movie feel very unique, adds a tragic angle. And, I mean, it is yeah. the movie, right? That is the story. And, I mean, I, I love the starting in you know with Vlad the Impaler renouncing God and stuff because I do think that changes the whole tone of the movie where you do have a sympathy for Dracula the whole time, right? He is such a tragic figure. Yeah, for sure. 
All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. I love this movie. I'll just say, I mean, I can't believe it's taken me this long to watch it. It's going to be something I watch. I can imagine again in future Halloweens to help get into the spirit because this movie leans into that vibe and atmosphere so much better than any other movie in recent memory. I think the last thing I have to say is this. So everyone, before you go, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, a word before you go. I hope the memories of Dracula and Renfield won't give you bad dreams. So just a word of reassurance. When you get home tonight and the lights have been turned out and you are afraid to look behind the curtains and you dread to see a face appear at the window, why, just pull yourself together and remember that, after all, there are such things as vampires. All right, after the credits, if people stick around past the One Take logo. So when 1931 Dracula came out, the movie ended with that epilogue delivered by Van Helsing. He like walks out in front of the curtain and says all that. And then it got cut because uh, I guess people were afraid of the religious implications of like saying vampires are real, especially once the movie's done. You're saying like, no, that stuff was real. So it got cut out. And unfortunately, it's mostly lost. But I think they did actually find some of the footage. So you can see little bits of Van Helsing uh, you know, delivering that. But anyway... I just love that. What a great way to, uh, to end the movie. It's chilling. My history of horror video ends with the same monologue. So, mm. yeah. You're like, that was scary. Tonight I'm, when the I'm, lights I'm, are turned out, <laughs> I'm gonna, you're going to dread looking behind the curtain. <laughs> you're going to see my Google searches later. It's going to be like, vampires aren't real, right? And then you finally, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, a word before you go. <laughs> you're like, no, it's happening again. <laughs> All right, cool. Let me end this. Wow. The one take thing? Oh, uh, well, we ended on the spooky, you know. All right, all right. 